Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you, members. And uh, good evening to everybody. And welcome to the first council meeting of the new civic year and the new session of this full council. Welcome to all the new members. There's so many of you, I have to say, and it grieves me terribly to say this, that there's probably quite a few of you who I don't know, who I haven't met, and whose names will almost certainly escape me from one meeting to the next. I've reached the age where you can't necessarily always grab hold of a name quickly enough. However, I know my colleagues here are going to have got it all lined up and we're going to kick me and we'll make sure I get everything right. So, we've got a slightly different pattern, as you would expect, slightly different pattern for the, the meeting. We are first of all having um, a special meeting uh, to appoint a new honorary alderman. And when that has been done, we will move on with our ordinary meeting, which I look forward to being clear, constructive, positive, and supportive. So, we have received apologies for this evening's meeting from Councillor Doughty. Are there any other further apologies from members? Yes, Councillor Carr. Councillor Galvin uh, sends his apologies, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Myers. Councillor Webb sends his apologies. Thank you very much. Those are noted. Can I remind members, officers and other members of the public to please turn your mobile phones to silent for the duration of both council meetings. Thank you very much. So, the special meeting of council has been convened with one item on the agenda to deal with a motion to confer the title of Honorary Alderman of the City of York upon former councillor Anne Reid. Under Section 249 of the Local Government Act 1972, the Council has the power to grant the title of Honorary Alderman of the City of York, and this honour must be conferred at a special meeting of the Council. I now formally move the motion to grant the title of Honorary Alderman of the City of York upon Anne Reid in recognition of her service to the City of York as set out in the Special Council Agenda. Uh, I now invite the Leader to second the motion. Formally seconded, Lord Mayor. Are there any further comments or can I take that as agreed, Members? If you're agreed. A civic presentation of the scroll will be arranged in due course for the new Honorary Alderman. <coughs> And that concludes the business of the special meeting. Next, we come to the ordinary meeting of council. And can I remind everyone to speak clearly during debate? Use your microphones and please, especially a reminder to everyone, please switch off your microphone when you have finished speaking. The system only allows myself, inevitably, um, plus a further three speakers to be registered at any one time. So please indicate that you wish to speak by raising your hand and then you will be called at the appropriate time. Depending on how the meeting progresses, I intend to call a short break um, at around 8 p.m. for a comfort break. But as usual, we have a lot of business to get through this evening, so I'd be grateful if we could keep the meeting focused and to the point, and I shall not hesitate to step in and speak if I think we are going astray. So, we will move on to the agenda of the meeting. May I ask all members who have a personal, prejudicial, or disclosable pecuniary interest in any of the business to be discussed at tonight's meeting to declare your interest now if they are not already in the register of interests. Councillor Culwick. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I've sought advice uh, with regard to um, motions on notice, agenda item number eight. The third of those motions, I'll take no part in the debate as I manage a small number of properties on a commercial basis. Thank you very much. Are there any other declarations of interest? Yes. 
Thank you, Lord Mayor. I sought advice and I declare a personal and potentially prejudicial interest in item 13A, the amendment to supplementary budget. Thank you very much. Right, then we will move on. Tonight we do have a special extra item as part of civic business. Um, as you will remember, those of you who were at our annual meeting, um, the sheriff that I wished to appoint, Joe Trithel, um, who was appointed at the annual meeting to take on the mantle of sheriff, was unavoidably on holiday. Life was being very difficult and fast moving at that time, as you will recall. And so my former colleague, Daffid Williams, stepped up to the plate and has very kindly and very excellently filled the role as sort of proxy sheriff, sheriff in wait, well, I don't know what you call it, but he's been acting sheriff for um, the last six, seven weeks and continues um, until the 25th of July, 2019. But this is the first occasion where we have the opportunity to formally appoint Joe as the sheriff for the civic year to enable her to take the oath. And, but Daff is going to continue his, his role as sub, right honorable substitute for, for Joe for the remainder of our civic year when she is perhaps unavailable. So we will now have a short ceremonial process for the exchange of civic chains from Daff to Joe in formal recognition of the honor of acting Sheriff of York. Uh, the outgoing sheriff will now say a few brief words. So, Daffid. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, it's, I noticed you slipped the word brief in there, knowing consciously that I don't think I've ever spoken briefly in my life, so I'm sure I will try to live up to my reputation. Um, it has been a genuine pleasure to serve in the role uh, for the nine weeks uh, that I'm uh, going to have been in the role uh, as Sheriff, and as has already been alluded to, uh, the Lord Mayor and the new Sheriff have uh, very kindly said that I can continue to substitute in the role of Sheriff on a number of occasions when the, when the uh, time is appropriate to do so. So I'm still going to be actively involved throughout the rest of the year, and that's uh, a great pleasure. Um, it's a great pleasure not least because it gives me the opportunity to carry on serving and working with our current Lord Mayor, uh, who I have to say Obviously, I've known for a number of years and I've uh, thoroughly enjoyed working with, um, but I've got to work with much more closely over the course of the last nine weeks than I've ever done before. Uh, and I think York should be very grateful for Janet Looker. She is a genuine ambassador of this city um, and someone who brings joy whenever she comes to events. The number of events that I have sat there and thought, Janet's not paying attention at the moment. She's not listening, I can tell. She's, she's, she's zoned out. I'm, oh, I'm, I'm wondering if she's, she's not going to be quite up to it. And then she steps up to the microphone and delivers the most amazing speeches I've ever heard. Um, she, at a student union awards event that we had uh, a few weeks ago, uh, I went on and presented an award very early on, gave my bit, came off fairly smug, having cracked a few jokes, thinking I'd done that really well. Uh, then watched Janet, I thought, she's going to fall asleep here, she's not quite paying attention to this. And then she, so she stepped up onto the stage and I thought, oh, she's going to, this isn't going to work. And then she threw away her speech and just spoke for 10 minutes, having those students in the utter palm of her hands and got the biggest ovation I've ever heard at the end of it, having been incredibly funny and connected with every one of those students. Uh, and just this weekend, attending the races with uh, the Duke of York in attendance, uh, he asked her, 
whether she was going to be betting on any of the races. And she sort of stopped, looked over the top of her glasses, and said, can I tell you a story? And I thought, this is going to be epic. Uh, I know it's going to be epic. And she proceeded to tell him about how one of his ancestors had ripped off the city in connection to the races in many years gone by. And I thought, there is nobody else I've ever met that would do that, only Janet Looker. I've been incredibly delighted to have the opportunity to work with her. I know, Joe, you are going to have an amazing time doing that, because she is a brilliant person to work alongside uh, and take every opportunity to do that. Uh, and thoroughly enjoy the events that you go to, because what I've noticed about this, having served as a politician for a long time, it's the first time I've ever turned up to things and people are pleased to see me. Um, <laughs> who knew that was possible? Uh, so it's, for those people, I want to echo the words that John Galvin said at annual council. Councillor Galvin, apologies. Uh, for those people who are new to council or who have been or are cynical about civic offices, uh, I've always been cynical about it as a politician, I have to say, until I've done the role. Actually, there's a real power in going along to events to say thank you to the people who are doing the thing that they're doing, to celebrate the successes of the many things that go on around the city, and having someone come to say, on behalf of the city, well done, thank you for what you do. There is a real power in that, uh, and it's something that all of us, as people who are engaged in public life, should choose to celebrate. I'm really grateful for having had the chance to serve. I'm sorry that was a little less brief than you probably intended, Lord Mayor. Thank done. you very much, Dan. <laughs> the Sheriff, Jo Trifal, will now make her declaration of acceptance of office. I, Jo Trifal, having been appointed to the office of Sheriff of the City of York, hereby declare that I take the said office upon myself and will duly and faithfully fulfil the duties thereof according to the best of my judgment and ability. The Sheriff will now take the affirmation of allegiance. I, Joe Trithel, Sheriff of the City of York, do solemnly and sincerely and truly declare and affirm and say that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors according to law. It's all yours. Uh, I, I would just like to add to these solemn pronouncements what a wonderful honour it is I feel I have... Uh, been bestowed with this evening and I would like to thank everybody here today for doing that. Uh, I know that there has been flexibility in arranging matters so that it can proceed and uh, well thank you for being so so flexible. Um, I'm also, I also wish to express my thanks to uh, David Williams who has stepped in so magnificently, I understand, to uh, uh, allow the Office of Sheriff to be discharged. And uh, all I can say is thank you to him and that I will do my very best to follow his act, which I understand is going to be a difficult task to <laughs> discharge. Um, I'd also like to say that I am a long-standing friend of the Lord Mayor and I've worked with her professionally and as Daph has alluded to, it will be a real pleasure to work with her again in this office. Thank you. Thank you very much, both Daph and, and Joe. It's been an extraordinary pleasure to work with Daph. He and I both took this, well, he took this job on with a week's notice. I had a fortnight. And so we have both had to rise, shall I say, to the occasion. Um, but he has been outstanding, and I'm glad that he is still able to give us some of his time to continue to support. So I'll move on very briefly to civic gifts. There have there's not been a lot. I had a bunch of flowers, but I'm afraid they've died, so I haven't been able to bring them along. Um, I think they're now in the compost bin, sadly. Um, but I did have a very nice 
large framed montage of photos from St. Elred's School, where it was a great pleasure to open their mugger, and they didn't ask me to do anything terribly athletic, which was a good thing, but um, it was a pleasure to visit the school. Um, an interesting visit from some Chinese uh, delegates who came to present prizes for an art competition where some of our pupils in the city had, had won, and they gave us um, some gifts there. And, gosh, I'm not sure. Have a look if, if, if you're interested. It's, we haven't started to really build up the, you know, the, the gold and the silver and the precious jewels that will almost certainly come my way as um, the civic year progresses. But we will keep you posted. So, um, where do we move on to now? We now come to public participation. Um, and as usual, I would like to remind everyone of how I will deal with this. All the public speakers are currently seated at the side. Each speaker will come up to the microphone in turn and then return to their seat when they have finished. Once all the speakers have finished, those who wish to stay for the remainder of the meeting will be directed to the public seating areas. We have nine speakers this evening. Is that right? Yeah, no, eight. one eight. One hasn't, or hasn't yet um, arrived. Um, so yes, Anna, Anna Semlian hasn't um, hasn't come yet. But I will call upon our first speaker, Lynette Mills, who would like to speak on the supplementary budget proposals of Agenda Item 13 with regard to graffiti removal on private premises. And you have three minutes. And good evening, Lord Mayor and Councillors. My name is Lynette Mills. I live in Fishergate. Thank you for the opportunity to address this council on the subject of graffiti. The majority of graffiti seen around York is the tagging variety, territory marking by gangs and has no artistic merit at all. It sends the message of gang activity urban decay and vandalism, and it discourages walkers and visitors to our beautiful medieval city. Graffiti in York seems to be on the rise. When we first came to York in 2006, there was no graffiti on the walls along the River Foss Basin. And this remained the case for 11 years until August 2017, when the first spray paint tagging appeared. This was rapidly followed by overtagging, and to date there have been a further two cases of graffiti scrawl on the wall. The latest occurred about the same time as the Barbican Centre and the cemetery walls were defaced. Graffiti begats graffiti. Graffiti artists, and I say that in commas, virtual commas, want their art and their tagging to be seen. Research has shown that quickly removing graffiti discourages further incidents. This is a policy adopted by many city councils throughout the world, one of zero tolerance, where every attempt is made to remove graffiti within 24 hours. And this is the policy I urge York City Council to adopt. Why then should the council be responsible for removing graffiti from private pro property, you may ask? Because irrespective of whether it is a private or public space that has been targeted, it still amounts to vandalism and is often an eyesore to the general public. For example, the graffiti along the River Foss Basin must be seen by hundreds of people every day using St. George's Field car park as well as those enjoying a walk down the banks of the River Foss or those visiting the Barbican Centre. I do recognise that some graffiti can be art. Banksy springs to mind. And I would support the creation of a graffiti wall or walls in a suitable location in the city. To summarise, graffiti is vandalism that sends a message of urban decay. It is of public concern that graffiti be removed from private as well as public property. And the target should be to remove graffiti within 24 hours of its appearance. It would be wonderful as councillors and custodians of this fine city that under your watch, 
this stain on our city could be dealt with effectively. Councillors, I thank you for your time. <coughs> thank you, Ms Mills. Your comments have been noted and members will take them into account um, when they debate that item. I now call upon our second registered speaker, Dr Mick Vithian, York Natural Environment Trust, who would like to speak on motion number four at item eight on the agenda, the Pollinator Action Plan. Lord Mayor, Councillors, I am pleased that the Green Party have put forward this motion for a City of York Pollinator Action Plan. I am a member of York Natural Environment Trust, YNET, which was formed in 1988 with the support of the then Council to conserve and improve the disappearing green spaces in and around the city, which we did by initiating York's first green site survey, published by Martin Hammond in 1991, and being involved in subsequent work resulting in the current, if rather belated, Biodiversity Action Plan. It was with YNET that discovered and encouraged St Nicholas's Field Tip to be preserved as a public open space. Unfortunately, after our repeated appearances opposing the Council's attacks on the Greenbelt at public inquiries, including Derwent Thorpe, Heslington East and the local plan, we became personae non grata at the Guildhall. For the last two decades, we have repeatedly suggested that York's road verges could be better used for wildlife. This more recently took the form of a loose coalition in 2007 onwards called Wildflowering York, which had support from some officers, but unfortunately not the ones who still wanted traditional management and held the purse strings. If the Council is serious about pollinators, carbon sequestration and saving the planet, they need to do more than paying lip service to the notion by scattering some wildflower seed, which is not dissimilar to the mitigation being proposed by the Environment Agency for destroying rare grassland with hundreds of years of history at Rawcliffe Meadows, where Wynette first spent five years taming the noxious weeds that had invaded the poorly managed grassland. Further years of, of work were spent keeping those weeds out and the nutrient levels down by cutting and grazing to establish what was acknowledged as a site of special scientific interest in 2013. I don't expect the council to go to the extremes we had to use to bring back the native species hiding beneath the sward but those who have rewilded verges have employed best practices over an extended period after preparation and planning. However, the poorly managed, preserved or mitigated areas of Derwentthorpe should be a reminder of what a lack of commitment results in. Conservation is a well-established science, not a case of rotivation, rotivate, chuck down some seed and see what comes, then walking away when it doesn't bloom immediately. The Council's record over the 30 years of your Wynet's existence has been one of permitting gardens to be concreted over, ignoring tree felling and cutting down hedgerows, along with failing to enforce Section 106 agreements that permitted areas to deteriorate. Verges, trees and wildlife ponds and streams need long-term management, which then also sequesters the CO2 this Council has made a promise to reduce. Most importantly, they sustain the wildlife the planet depends on and make the place look loved, unlike the short-term investment it frequently gets in York. Let's not be satisfied with a few traffic islands of flora, but have them as part of that green infrastructure plan and those green corridors that have been talked about for so many years. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr Fithian. Your comments have been noted and will be taken into account when members debate that motion. I will now call upon the third speaker, and he's there already, John Cossum, who would also like to speak on motion number four on behalf of Extinction Rebellion. Actually, I'm not speaking on behalf of Extinction Rebellion, funnily enough. I'm just speaking on behalf of myself, because what you don't know about me is that when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, I used to collect insects, I used to breed them, I used to pin them, and I love insects, and I think they're one of the most important parts of our biodiversity. So I want to ask you to support, wholeheartedly support, any, any way possible to support pollinators, and this, this plan from the Green Party is a start. It's not enough. We can't just rely on roadside ver verges. 
Um, and pollinators are only a tiny amount of the invertebrate species that we need to look after. Invertebrates are the, one of the things that underpins our whole ecology. And we need invertebrates to feed our birds and to feed amphibians and to and hedgehogs, that kind of thing. So if we, if we lose our invertebrates, which include pollinators like bees, flies and beetles, then, then we lose a whole lot more. Other people will talk about pollinators in terms of feeding humans. Well, yeah, a whole lot of our food is uh, due to flowers being pollinated, giving us fruit and nuts and seeds to eat. But pollinators and invertebrates more widely are important in their own right. They have every right to be, and we do not have a right to make them extinct. Um, what I'd like to refer you to is a very, very good document called the National Pollinator Strategy 2014. Uh, our wonderful government has produced this, and it's a very, very interesting document. If there's somebody who is in charge of the Biodiversity Action Plan here, they need to, they need to look at that and digest that. It's very, very good. Um, it talks about habitat loss and hab habitat creation. You can find out more very accessible on a website called Bumblebee Conservation Stroke Bees Needs. We need to look at how we use insecticides like neonicotinoids. They're very, very toxic to all insects. Herbicides like glyphosate remove flowering plants for our pollinators. Inappropriate mowing. We don't need to mow as often as we do. It's a waste of energy and it damages the ecology. We need integrated pest management. Some of you will know what that is. Um, we need to look at not just roadsides, but hedgerows and orchards and farmland. That includes horticulture and livestock farmland. We need to look at private gardens and, and public parks. We need to look at roadsides and railways and schools. There is so much more that we can do. So and if you could wind up. I am winding up. Uh, so I just urge you to do everything you can as powerful people, as councillors, to promote biodiversity in the city of York. So thank you, Green Party, for this, for this opportunity to pr promote that bit. Thank, thank you, you very much, John. Your comments have certainly been noted and will be taken into account when the motion is debated. And I'm now delighted to say that we have Anna Semlian with us. So we will go on to our fourth speaker, who would like to speak on motion number one at agenda item eight, the carbon neutral city. Three minutes. Thank you. So my name is Anna Semlian, former city councillor. It's nice to be back. Um, so I'm a cyclist and I'm talking to you uh, on behalf of York Cycle Campaign, of which I've been a member since about 95. Um, so York Cycle Campaign aims to make cycling safe, convenient, accessible for absolutely everyone in York. We would like to express support for the carbon neutral city motion being put forward by Councillor Crawshaw. The most recent emissions report from the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy shows that transport is now the single largest source of greenhouse emissions in the UK, making up one third of our emissions. Whilst other sources of emissions such as energy, business, residential have all fallen in recent years, transport emissions have remained stubbornly static and current transport emissions are the same as they were in 1990, nearly 30 years ago. So reducing transport emissions is critical if York is to deliver on its aim of becoming carbon neutral by 2030. Cycling can play a key role in making this happen in York. It's a technology that already exists, it's available to many, and doesn't require hugely expensive investment to make it happen. In fact, I suspect many of us arrived by bike today, as I did. Like many Dutch cities, York's flat landscape and relatively dry climate make it ideal for everyday cycling. The advent of electric cycles has further opened up this mode of transport to a greater range of people and makes longer distant journeys more feasible for many. 
If we are to become a carbon neutral city by 2030, it's essential that all new developments in and around York have high quality cycle provision designed into them from the outset, providing people with a real alternative to cars. This is about traffic reduction fundamentally and the reduction of polluting unnecessary vehicle modes that involve engines. We'd be happy to work with the Council in designing appropriate cycle for infrastructure and exploring ways in which new developments can be truly cycle and pedestrian friendly places. And speaking personally, not on behalf of the cycle campaign, I do urge you to have lower road speeds built into the new developments. Thank you. Thank you very much. And your comments have been noted and will certainly be taken into account when the motion is debated. Um, I now call upon the fifth speaker, the Honourable Alderman Brian Watson, who wishes to speak on the report of the Executive Leader at item six on the agenda. Brian. Thank you, Lord Mayor. <coughs> Councillor de Gorn, first of all, regarding resident parking. You tell us about exploring the options for an area currently not covered by exports of the parking. Similar demands close to the community stadium are what you envisage. Can you firstly sort out the situation there of the charging, which has been an extra burden, put upon the park and ride site on match days? I've asked this of several people and we seem to be getting absolutely nowhere, as is usual. It is obvious to everyone that when this happens, it will only lead to street parking. And you can maybe overcome that by a rest park if you can get it in place by then. But it still leads to parking problems and chaos on match days on that park and ride site. You also talk about Castlegate. We are now engaged in yet another round of ideas and sticking on post-it notes covering everything. And it cursed me because we have covered every mortal thing that you can think of. This time we had a representative to the YMT. He could not offer any sense or explanation of what size the extension would be to the Castle Museum. That left us with nothing to base our facts on again. So, you know, this is a massive thing that's going to happen in the middle of York, and it's going to be messed up at the end. Some form of sense has got to be put into that, and I hope you can do it. The second one is for Councillor A, the Executive Member for Finance. This, I believe, on your report, is the first time any explanation called for slightly mistily, has now ever been given for a delay to the stadium. The council will be receiving with partners to better understand issues that have led to delays. Forgive me, but surely, after all these years, you can't be serious in saying that you don't really understand the issue. What on earth have you been doing over all these years? Please, you know, forget most of the confidential lessons and items that you come across and further update the public. You know, when these things are published, don't let it stick there in the council meetings or with officers. Put it out to the public where it should be available to. After all, it's been done for the council and the council are the public. Can you wind up, please? Although I think that you lost control of this many years ago. You say you're sharing the frustration of sports fans and residents who want to see it up and running. Pull the other one, Nigel. If you honestly did, you would have been telling them what's gone Can wrong long ago. In fact, it would be just a full-time job for you and a top-up priority. That's it. Oh, I forgot. The council don't understand the issues. Thank you very much, Councillor. Alderman, uh, Alderman. Thank you, Alderman. Your comments have been noted and will certainly be taken into account when those items are considered. Um, I now call upon the sixth speaker, Dave Merritt, 
who would like to speak about the York Central Development, a matter within the remit of Council, and he's speaking as Chair of York Environment Forum's Transport Group. All yours. Thank you, Lord Mayor, uh, Council. I'm actually additionally speaking on behalf of uh, York Central Action uh, tonight as well. We'd very much like to welcome the proposal for a new carbon reduction officer in the proposed council budget amendments. This will allow the council to progress the actions required to address the climate emergency uh, in line with the motion that was recently passed. However, we also wish to draw the council's attention to the severe deficiencies in the carbon footprint and sustainability of the proposed York Central development. We can confirm that the My York Central consultation was an innovative and highly productive consultation. It identified a strong vision for a highly sustainable, very low car development. Unfortunately, the developers paid virtually no heed to this widely supported view. Along with colleagues in the Civic Trust, York Bus Forum, amongst others, we welcome the dialogue with senior council members and officers in regard to the York Central development and the positive agreement that it needs to be more energy efficient. However, there are a number of other aspects, not least on the transport side, that also need addressing. We need to avoid choking our city with a 50% increase in peak hour congestion and the linked air pollution that the local plan transport analysis suggests new developments like this will collectively cause. This development and its infrastructure arrangements will probably be here at least a century or two, largely locking in its carbon footprint for decades to come. Carbon neutrality cannot be achieved by 2030 unless York Central, which will still be being built out then, other developments and transport in the city are radically altered, minimising private car use and maximising public transport, walking and cycling. We therefore are also strongly supportive of the Motion 1 proposed by Councillor Crawshaw on tonight's agenda and hope you will all support it. We all believe that the city has a chance to be a world leader, to showcase successful carbon neutral urban design and to boldly demonstrate that transport doesn't need to be entirely based around private cars. For the sake of future generations, our children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren, we would urge you to support further changes to the York Central development and to pass Councillor Crawshaw's motion tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Your comments, Dave, will have been noted. And I now call upon the seventh speaker, Gwen Swinburne, who wishes to speak on governance and council strategy as matters within the council's remit and on the budget proposals at agenda item 13. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillors, I focus mainly on governance transparency and how top staffers meet or not their statutory and constitutional obligations. To that end, under this administration, there are some seeds of hope, including in these papers. As a former committee clerk, I was horrified uh, to find that this council meeting, having been programmed for over a year, was changed at just a couple of weeks' notice to address what seemed to be a political expediency. Now that this has been done and clearly sanctioned by the latest statutory officers, where will it all stop? Meetings could be changed on a whim. This is badly done by the new administration and our statutory officers. It sets a dangerous precedent. Next, it comes as no surprise that for every new administration, the Section 151 officer finds endless streams of new money from savings, from contingencies, and from our copious mostly underreported reserve accounts, as well as more capital borrowing. I expect this administration to finally get to grips with the officers' frankly embarrassing capital programming. Again, last year, they delivered only 75% of a £106 million program. Exaggerated contingencies, opaque reserve management, and disturbing HR practices 
all need to be dealt with if you are to take back control. To that end, I will be asking councillors Eyre and Pavlovich to require far more specific reporting and monitoring on these matters. I will ask that an associated transparent framework be formed to finally ensure Chief Officer accountability. I wish to lodge a, a question to the leader and then one to the section 151, please. There is a significant backlog of complaints about statutory officer conduct lodged but waiting for a chief officer disciplinary process to be produced. Turkeys don't vote for Christmas, but we are fed up with waiting. What is happening? When will we have a chief officer disciplinary committee to finally manage their conduct issues, please? Finally, a question to the temporary chief executive. Councillor Nigel Eyre was completely cleared of any wrongdoing whatsoever months before the election. When will the temporary chief executive announce that the councillor is completely innocent? Will he apologise first to the councillor, but also to citizens for wasting £98,000 of our taxes on that outrageous witch hunt? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Sundan. Your comments have been noted. I now call upon the eighth speaker, Drew Thompson, a member of York Private Hire Association, who would like to speak about Uber taxes in York as a matter within the Council's remit. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to begin with a warm welcome from the taxi trade in York to all the councillors here who have retained their seats and to all those that are new to Chambers. It's a pleasure to see you all, but I am especially pleased to see the two members I voted for. I am speaking in front of full council for the first time. As a resident, here is why I feel it necessary to do so. On Friday the 28th of June, an Uber driver allegedly spat through the open window of their vehicle directly into the face of a female York resident. She had done nothing wrong. Sadly, this incident occurred in front of her two-year-old son. The Uber driver was identified by Bradford Council, who informed Uber, who then, at some point around the 3rd of July, removed him off their app whilst they allegedly investigated the assault. I was momentarily impressed with Uber, but it did not last long. It seems he was removed from the app for approximately one week. He was back in York and working on the Uber app last Friday in time for the races. What would you expect York Taxi Licensing or indeed a York operator's attitude to be in this situation? The police investigation into this assault is still ongoing, but Uber clearly do not care. They obviously regard the 25% cut that they take from this driver's fares more important than the safety of any of the residents or public in York. It is no wonder that this company were found to be not fit or proper to hold an operator's license in York. Even now, they continue to exhibit the kind of behaviour that proves every single day that our councillors made the right decision by refusing to relicense them. And now is the time to make another brave decision about Uber. On the 28th of September this year, our executive members will gather to decide the fate of Uber. I would like to encourage each and every one of you, our elected members, to openly discuss with each other how you feel about Uber. Consider everything that you know about them and examine what you know to be the correct course of action. They must be prosecuted or they will continue to put your public at risk. If you could wind up. Why don't you invite Wendy to, out for coffee and cake? She will explain everything that there is to know about Uber. It's law breaking, it's attempts to deregulate the trade and the way it is prepared to risk everyone's lives, everyone's lives purely for profit. Wendy is worth the investment of a little of your time as she has facts, figures, evidence and the truth on her side. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Thompson. Your comments have been noted. And very timely, I now call upon the ninth and final speaker, Wendy Loveday, 
Chair of York Private Hire Association, who would also like to speak about Uber. Three minutes. Thank you, Chair. Councillors, I have a favour to ask you all. Last week, this local Times headline grabbed my attention. Councillor shows support for local taxi drivers and warns residents to stay clear of Uber who are not licensed to operate in Tunbridge Wells. Their council posted a message on their Facebook page saying, going out tonight, we've seen a post from someone saying Uber is in town. They followed that statement with a clear message saying that Uber is not licensed by Tunbridge Wells Borough Council, so only to use locally licensed cabs, stating that there is a clear safety issue there. Uber responded with, we recognise that there have been concerns about private hire journeys, crossing jurisdictional boundaries, and then rabbited on a bit about their mythical uh, regions. Taxi licensing, as you all know, has nothing to do with regions. Drivers are not licensed in regions. We are licensed by individual local authorities. These jurisdictional boundaries are there to protect the public. So again, Uber needs reminding that they are not a licensing body. Taxi licensing is a local issue, regardless of what Uber wish that it was. Uber also mentioned working closely with local councils on this issue. My advice to any local council they're working with is beware, because Uber fudge the law by consistently, and to the point of embarrassment, quoting the Law Commission, which we know is not law. It is either waiting to be decided on or has already been rejected. It is absolutely not law. Uber quote the Law Commission because they cannot quote the actual law, because they break it thousands of times every single day all over the UK, including here in York. Every single Uber journey that originates in York is illegal. So every time that any of you see a passenger getting into an Uber in York, you are witnessing an unlawful act by Uber and by its drivers. So here's that favour I mentioned. If Tunbridge Wells Council can stand up for their drivers and promote their local cabs to their residents and visitors and warn them against the dangers of Uber, why can't York? We have asked them to, and they have refused, saying that they need to remain neutral. Members, I urge you to push York Council in the same direction that Tunbridge Wells Council willingly led themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wendy. Your comments have been noted, and that concludes the public participation session. If the speakers could now please make their way to the public seating area, if you want to stay, but there is no requirement to do so. Right, I have to, I said I would be making a total hash of this event. Um, I forgot in my excitement over sheriffs um, that we had not approved the minutes, which are sitting at agenda item two. There's two lots of minutes on pages one to 30 of your agendas. Um, now, we do need to formally approve those minutes. Um, do I have your approval? to sign the minutes for the last meeting of the 21st of March and the annual meeting of the 22nd of May. Is that agreed? Thank you very much indeed. Sorry, we will get it right next time. Okay, we now move on to... Sorry? Sorry, Councillor? The 22nd of May. It's a very minor error, but the actual location of the meeting is wrong. Sorry, I couldn't hear. Did you press your microphone? Sorry. Um, the, Can you the say that again? It's a minor thing, but the location of the meeting is wrong. It wasn't held in Sydney, it was held in the Guildhall. If, if there is an error, we will make sure that gets altered. Thank you very much indeed. 
Right. Petitions. We have none. It's too early in the year, isn't it? You haven't got yourselves acts together. I will expect 15 next time. Mm -hmm. I think we will have an ambitious target. At least one petition per member per session. Get going. Work at it. Which actually made me think, do you know, I've always thought what would be so nice is if life was a musical comedy. Um, as you may know, some of you were here last time round. Um, I, uh, I have been Lord Mayor before, and it did strike me when I came in with the sword and mace and everything, if council could have stood up and sung. Oh, welcome Dolly. Um, it's so nice to have you back where you belong. You're looking swell, Dolly. I should say, Dolly. It, you're still going, you're still growing, you're still going strong. Now, wouldn't have that have been glorious? Now, next time, we'll have a nice singing ovation. Thank you very much indeed. Right, item number six, report of the executive leader and executive recommendations and questions. So, and we're sticking to time. I now invite the leader, Councillor Aston, to present his written report which you will find at page 31 of the Council Papers. Thank you, Lord Mayor. And I do promise, members, I, I will not sing, and, and nor, nor would I recommend that we do at the, the start of, of meetings, although it thank, would you, be wonderful. thank you for the suggestion, Lord, Lord Mayor. Um, I'm very happy to, to move what is my first leader's report to Council this evening, uh, and I just wanted to touch on, on a couple of the key subjects highlighted in the report. Um, as I'm sure everyone will appreciate, since forming the new... Liberal Democrat and Green administration, it's been an extremely busy uh, period uh, as we begin, so to speak, to get our feet under the table in our new roles. Um, I am, of course, extremely privileged to be the leader of the Council uh, in this wonderful city, uh, and over the last couple of months I've endeavoured to meet a wide variety of stakeholders in the city and regionally to understand what their priorities are. Uh, and I would like to add at this stage a thank you to all uh, members from all sides for their support in different ways uh, since becoming leader. And I look forward to working with you over the next four years to achieve the best uh, for York. On, on that point, I would say that I've clocked that there have been five council leaders since 2014. So in saying four years, I'm hoping, I'm hoping to stay sl slightly longer. Uh, but none of these roles, whether it's as a councillor, as a group leader, as an exec member or a council leader, uh, are easy. Uh, I appreciate some of the, the, the challenges uh, and stresses uh, uh, ahead, but I hope that where we do agree, we can uh, work together for York. I will not go into a great detail in the budget proposals at this point, as we'll all have a later opportunity to discuss those proposals, although I will say that our proposed budget amendment has been designed to, to reflect uh, this is new administration's new priorities, and this is an opportunity to further increase funding in frontline services, improve work with communities, and invest in new initiatives, particularly to tackle the climate emergency. Noting the government's decision to reject an inquiry into the decision to grant outline planning permission for York Central, this vital project has been debated for decades in this city, and we are finally at a point where we can realistically seize the opportunity it presents to deliver more housing, new public spaces, and attract better paid jobs. But as a new administration, we are determined to ensure that York Central delivers improvements for everyone in the city. And that is why we are working with partners to secure further improvements to the development, particularly with regard to promoting clean growth. And these improvements will be discussed at a meeting of the executive tomorrow evening, whilst we continue to await the government decision on the HIF funding application. We have also embarked on the creation of a new council plan to guide the work of the council in delivering improvements for residents over the next four years. A draft structure has been created and will go out to a public consultation for the city's views on how we can achieve these outcomes. And I would strongly encourage uh, all members to engage with that consultation and provide feedback before the plan is presented back to full council. An equally important public consultation will be the citizens' assembly to look at how the council can work best to be as open and transparent as possible moving forward. The proposals for the Citizens' Assembly, alongside a review of the Constitution, will be outlined in the Report on Governance, which is scheduled for the Executive on the 26th of September. 
One of the most frequent subjects I've encountered since becoming leader is the government LEP review and devolution, and I could speak at length, if not the whole meeting, on, on some of those issues. On this occasion, I agree with the, the Metro Mayor, Dan Jarvis, who has commented that actually the imposition of simplistic requirements on complex economic boundaries is fundamentally flawed and not actually in the best interests of our businesses, our councils and our communities. Nonetheless, we are having conversations with uh, both neighbouring LEPs and the combined authority to strike the best deal uh, in the interests of York. Lastly, I just wanted to highlight that I have raised concerns with, about the upcoming closure of the East Coast Main Line and its impact on York, and as a result, I have now held productive meetings with representatives from Network Rail, who do seem to understand the concerns of the city and have agreed to communicate more clearly and consult for, far earlier in advance of their next programme of works uh, for the following year. I will stop there, Lord Mayor, whilst moving the written report and welcoming later any questions from members on these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there any group leaders who wish to respond? Mm -hmm. Councillor Myers. Thank you, Lord Mayor, and welcome to the Chair. Firstly, I really would like to pay tribute to your leadership of the Labour Group over the last four, uh, three plus years. And thank you for all your support and advice. As you often quoted Shakespeare in your leader's speeches, I'll start with one from the same tradition. Speak what we feel, not what we ought to say. Fairly straightforward advice from the bad, but in politics, of course, this is not always the done thing. For those that don't know me, what you can count on me to say is what I feel. What I know the people we represent feel when vital services are drastically cut and when you fail to take action to improve people's day-to-day -day living in York. Crucially, over the last four years, we've seen York rise to become the most unequal city outside of London and the South East, with the average home now costing more than 10 times the average wage. Last year, those wages fell by more than any other city in the country, and at the same time, our schools received the lowest funding per pupil. This crisis demands a visionary council leadership and one that is genuinely progressive. Looking towards the new executive, we see that once again, it's jobs for the boys. Two men, yet again, at the top of the council's leadership. An executive inflated to the maximum of nine, that is also two thirds men. We've sent the Labour Group's childcare policies to the chief executive, and we hope that you will adopt these at the earliest opportunity just one of a number of measures we have outlined that could proactively ensure that this council makes positive strides to ensuring it better reflects the city it seeks to serve. Regarding the emergency budget, we welcome many of the measures in the budget proposal, many of which Labour have been calling for for some time, including money for road improvements, subsidised bus routes, investment in the Northern Forest Initiative, not sure about why there's been such a delay there, and carbon reduction programmes also is an exercise in smoke and mirrors. Council leader refers to investment in children's and adult social care services rather than acknowledge this is in part a bailout for missed savings targets approved by the former administration. The risk reserve items are no more than an admission of failure of previous budgets where millions have been cut. I'll talk about our emergency budget measures and, and yours at, at a later opportunity that I'm assured we'll, we'll receive. On York Central, we've in, in the executive report tentative suggestions of a change in the approach of the new coalition. We know that the York Central Strategy Board are interested in the views of the new administration, yet when I lobbied both the Lib Dem leader and the Green leader before that first meeting of those partners, the response was no change in approach. We remain very concerned by the lack of an economic appraisal for this site. We feel there's widespread lack of understanding about what sort of jobs will end up on York Central, what jobs will move from other sites in York, potentially missing out on the once-in-a-lifetime development on publicly owned land that should transform our city's economy, our city's housing crisis, and with it reducing the inequalities too many of our residents currently face. I'd like to round up by expressing gratitude to all those involved in Armed Forces Day and hope that any future work the Council undertakes will look into why 
Armed Forces personnel are declaring negative experiences of living in York. And consider what more can be done to reduce this. The Armed Forces Covenant must be about more than paying lip service to those who have served our country. Just to finish, what you can be sure of is our support for genuinely progressive policies and our cooperation to be part of a council that improves the lives of the people of York, whilst highlighting what we'll do differently and why. Our vision for a fairer, more sustainable and more prosperous city that works for everyone is clear, and we will fight from opposition to deliver. Thank you. Is there any other? Yeah. Councillor Carr. Thank you, Lord Mayor. It's not so much a, a long response. It's uh, two questions, really, of the leader. He mentions a citizens' assembly. How will the members of that assembly be selected? First question. And the second question is, do you not feel, after the last election, that you have a sufficient mandate? Thank you very much. Councillor Aston, do you wish to speak and say anything in reply? Yes, thank, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, just to also add my, my welcome to you as a new Lord Mayor and also to, to Councillor Myers and actually to Councillor Carr in their new, their new roles as, as group leaders. I hope they last a little bit, a little bit longer than, than some previous occupants of all these different roles. Um, picking up um, Councillor Myers' point first, a lot of what you said is actually exactly the reason we put forward the Fair Deal for York motion, and I hope you've had an opportunity to read that, um, which obviously is calling for that crucial investment into transport, into skills, into infrastructure, into improving productivity. Uh, and hopefully, if we pass that, we'll then feed through into work on the council plan and the new economic strategy, and that's exactly what we're going to be doing, getting on delivering, rather than just talking uh, about it. Um, in terms of the new areas of investment, Actually, though, that the investment into the children's social care and adult social care are into new areas. So, for example, as set out in the papers, um, in children's social care, it's looking at further quality assurance work uh, around our social care work. And in adult social care, that will be including uh, new approaches to using technology um, rather than as you have, have described. But I'd welcome conversations with you in advance of meetings if that would uh, help you. Um, on York Central... What is absolutely vital is that we don't risk the opportunity to seize the new houses, the economic growth, the new public spaces. Unfortunately, your group has no consistent policy. On the one hand, you've been calling for more commercial space. On the other hand, your city's MP has been calling for more housing. Uh, and in the middle of that, we can't actually risk moving that project forward. Given that we've stated and set out in the executive report tomorrow a raft of areas where we would like to work with you in the city to seize those opportunities and move it forward. Let's work together on seizing, not risking uh, that funding that would really make a hugely significant difference to the city in the future. Um, on the Armed Forces Community Covenant, York has been absolutely leading that work, not just here in York, but across all of the neighbouring North Yorkshire districts. And for example, a couple of years ago, secured a very significant grant which funded the research work, which funded the outreach, and it is absolutely vital and will continue to, to work with our armed forces community in pushing that, that work uh, forward. Um, Councillor Carr's two points. Um, I cannot answer the first one specifically, uh, but that will be set out in the report to the executive on the 26th of September. But if you have any particular thoughts on how residents, businesses, councillors should be selected, please please do sort of send them in before that, that work's uh, done. Uh, and on the, the, the second point, um, the, the Green and Liberal Democrat parties were the two groups that made significant progress uh, in terms of the election between us achieving over 50% uh, of the vote, and obviously for my particular party, gaining a significant uh, number of seats off some of your former, your former colleagues. So, yes, I do believe uh, that we have that, that mandate between us to move forward uh, the, the city and obviously our council plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now invite members to ask questions of the leader on his report. Standing orders allow 10 minutes for questions and comments. The leader may respond directly to any question asked or comment made, or may agree to submit a written answer if unable to respond to the detail which will be circulated to all council members within five working days. 
I do think questions are enormously important, and I hope our questions will be focused and our answers will be short and to the point. Councillor Callum Taylor. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, right. So we talked about York Central a little bit just now, and I'd like to ask quite a specific one. Now, given the uh, ongoing calls on the local taxpayer to fund the York Central scheme pending the government making a decision on our 77 million housing infrastructure fund bid, can the leader confirm in months or even years how long he is willing to wait for a decision? Apologise, Councillor Taylor, I didn't catch the very first bit of the question. However, if I, if I answer without having heard that first bit, hopefully the answer will be the same. So you want to know how long will I wait for the HIF funding announcement from the government? I want to know that with the added question of how long are we going to keep thinking about putting more taxpayers' money in without having an answer on that HIF fund bid? Because I know our executive, you're looking at putting a little bit of money in. How long are we going to go? Don't, don't do that. If you didn't hear my question first time, I'm trying to explain it for you. Cheers. Thank you. We normally stand up when we're addressing the Lord Mayor. That's all I was indicating. Um, you, you're not. The Lord Mayor is totally egalitarian in her life and believes in equality of opportunity. Can so we all sit down? We could all sit down if you want to. Um, Thank you, Lord Mayor. So the first question, it's absolutely vital that we get uh, an announcement from the government on HIF funding as soon as possible. Um, I've written to the, the government minister uh, and I've written to Julian Sturdy and spoken to Julian Sturdy about the importance of, of getting that announcement. Unfortunately, you may have noticed that the, the, the government, uh, through the, the leadership election in the Conservative Party, is perhaps not in a position that we would have liked for ministers to be making uh, those decisions, but we will do absolutely all that we can through all of the partners in York Central uh, to get that decision and convince the, the, the ministers to make that decision as soon as possible. That timeline is not in my control, it's in the, the government minister's uh, control and anything we can do between us would be really welcome at uh, unlocking uh, that decision moving forward. Um, with regards to the additional uh, funding for York Central, that's coming in the report to the Council Executive uh, tomorrow evening. Uh, that particular report sets out significant information on the risks of both not investing and moving forward with York Central, and equally the consideration of the risks of, of putting that money in um, at this particular stage. And it goes back to the, the answer that I gave to your group leader. We must not risk seizing the opportunities of getting those huge benefits in terms of housing, public spaces and, and economic growth that we have the opportunity now to deliver, now that the outline planning permission has been granted for York Central. There's absolutely still time as we approach the Reserve Matters application mm -hmm. and in doing further my York Central style consultations on a raft of the mm -hmm. details that we set out in tomorrow's report. But we cannot put our foot on the brakes and stop spending money and risk not taking the opportunities that that gives. So please work with us to make sure the scheme that all the groups and all the parties in this council have been signed up for for decades, and indeed your particular party was criticising us when Councillor Waller was leader for not progressing it quickly enough. So it really is vital that we do everything we can to make sure that project happens. Is there a supplementary, Councillor Taylor? Okay. A supplementary? Well met. Sorry, is this supplementary, a supplementary? Supplementary, please, Lord Mayor. Okay. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, just on, on that point of progressing the uh, application uh, and, and getting to the HIF uh, funding, um, as you know, Network Rail has not yet signed land registry documents. Without those signed land registry documents, we can't agree the 106 agreements. Without the agreements of the 106 funding, we can't progress the planning approval and it can't be formally issued. We've known that for three years. So why were we forced to take an outline planning application decision in March when so many questions were still unanswered? The overwhelming push from everybody apart from the applicants was to defer that to get a better deal. We've pushed it forward, yet we can't progress it. So I'd like to know what you're going to do to try and breach that impasse and why it is that it was felt by the previous executive that we had to push when we knew that planning approval could not be formally issued. Councillor Aston. 
Thank you, uh, Lord Mayor. Obviously, I wasn't uh, a member of the planning committee, so I can't speak for the specific planning decision, which I understand a wide variety of members from all parties, including Labour, uh, supported. Uh, at the time, it, it went to the, the, the planning committee. Um, it goes back to my point of, of being really important that we work with all partners as part of the York Central partnership, including Network Rail, Homes England, and those other big public sector partners to make sure that it's progressed as, as, as quickly as possible. Uh, the next thing to do is unlock the, the, the HIF funding and work to do that. You're absolutely right. Then publishing the, the, the planning decision and then working with the community on those reserve, future reserve matters planning applications. And as I say, I see that very much as being an opportunity to have a, another My York Central style of approach on a whole raft of transport, environment and affordable housing issues that are set out in, in tomorrow's executive report, which I hope, as I say, that people welcome and get involved in those conversations and we see the benefits of the scheme. Is that a supplementary, Councillor Pavlovich? You're... Okay, supplementary. I'll keep it... Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I'll keep it really brief. Um, the HIF funding's not in our gift. We've put an application in. Since the application went in, there's been two announcements of um, funding allocations on the HIF, neither of which included York. The scheme in your papers tomorrow um, say without the HIF funding, there's a whole heap of other funding that's going to be jeopardised and the whole scheme's not, uh, not viable. Um, what are the risks of putting more money in um, from the public purse if the HIF funding doesn't come through. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I assume the reverse of these questions is that the Labour Group supports securing the HIF funding in order to move the York Central development forward. So that is what we need to all work together to, to achieve. The paper that's going to the executive tomorrow sets out in the risks and finance section in quite some detail um, what the risks are of both not allocating further funding at this stage versus allocating further funding at the risk of knowing that we need to wait for that HIF de decision from the government, obviously in partnership with a range of, of, of public sector partners. But as I say, the overarching principle is that we must not risk the huge benefits that York Central will bring to a wide variety uh, of aspects of the city whilst making progress on that scheme. And I really, really do hope that you get behind some of those conversations and get your MP in there lobbying to unlock that HIF funding so we can see those improvements going forward. Because what I'm interested in is delivering York Central with those improvements, and that's what we should all be interested in. Councillor Rowley. Uh, the members, uh, following the, the leader's comments there about the government and about what's happening at the moment, as the only member that has a say on the future Prime Minister, I want to assure you uh, that I have discharged my responsibilities um, and I've already voted. Um, my question is, <laughs> my question is, given your Green Party members committed in the election not to be whipped, can the leader confirm that they have an effective veto over any coalition policy, or can they vote against things individually? Thank you, uh, Lord Mayor. I was hoping you were going to ask me who I would vote for. You know, how, had I been a Conservative Party member in your, your leadership uh, election? Um, with regard to your second point, you'll have to address the question on the Green Party's internal arrangements and whipping and the systems they've put in place to, to, to Councillor de Gorm. All we have done is obviously commit to working together uh, across our two parties and across all of the different councillors to work together to address many of the different challenges and, and opportunities. But as I said at the start, I know none of these roles are easy and I know certainly being leader isn't easy and you've got an awful lot of people to, to take with you as you have some of those uh, conversations. We've got time for just one very quick. Councillor Waters, would your question be very fast? <sighs> Always very brief, Lord Mayor. First of all, I'll just take time up welcoming you and the council leaders to your new roles. With regard to graffiti in the council leaders' report, um, one consequence of the ill-thought-out, poorly supervised and poorly executed fibre broadband installations across York has been 
in addition to trash verges, trash footpaths and trash roads, the imposition of hundreds of communications cabinets, or graffiti boards as I prefer to call them. Can the leader confirm that none of the 47 grand to tackle graffiti on private premises will be directed to cleaning up the disgraceful state of these graffiti boards? And can the leader inform us as what action is to be taken to ensure Virgin Media, Talk Talk, BT and any other operators face up to their responsibilities with regard to their infrastructure. Graffiti encourages graffiti, as one of the speakers said earlier, and this problem and the general rundown nature of many York streets is a direct consequence of the fibre broadband works and the indifference of senior officers at this council to these problems. These are graffiti questions I've addressed via email and unfortunately not received a reply. As regards the wider budget, it's, um, it's, a bit, it's a bit like what I've said. Every time another council is appointed, you were appointed democratically. It's your first budget. We should all, a bit like Brexit, respect democracy and vote to encourage all of the councillors in this chamber to support your first budget. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you very much. Councillor Aston, do you have a response? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Can I firstly re return and say thank you very much for your welcome and indeed thank you very much for, for indicating su support at this stage of the, of the new budget proposals for, for that reason. I'd be more than happy to, to meet with you and, and officers to discuss in more detail how that funding on tackling graffiti on, on private property can be used because you're right in highlighting there are not only issues on commercial and private property and actually at what stage would we clean and at what stage can we rebuild or recharge to commercial operators who we actually would expect to do that and do that much quicker and you will also know I have considerable sympathy as a, as a ward councillor on some of the, the work and standards of the utilities companies. We need to see the, the, the benefits in terms of the, the high internet speeds but equally they need to subscribe to service level agreements and we need to enforce against those if they don't live up to our expectations but I'd be happy to have a more detailed talk about it. Thank you very much. Right, that has brought the brought questions of the, of the leader to an end. Um, so I will now I'll invite Councillor Aston to move the recommendation of the Executive to Council from their meeting on the 27th of June, as contained in the minutes at page 3738 of your papers. Formally Councillor moved, Aston. Lord Mayor. And has, is there a seconder? Second. Is there any debate on this recommendation? Can we take a vote? Just raise your hand if you're in favour. That looks to me as if it's passed. So, we can move straight on. Um, I will now take a vote on the uh, recommendation which relates to the capital programme outturn 2018-2019 and revisions to the 2019-2020. Have I done that? I haven't turned my... We've done both of them, have we? No, it's just the one, it was the... Sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry. I said it's it was the, the first go. It's on the page. Yeah, right, we've done that. Report of the Deputy Leader. I thought I only had it on one item. Hello, Councillor Mayor. de Gaulle, it's I, your turn. I, uh, unlike the Leader, I, I understand I don't get to speak or even sing to this item. Um, so, uh, I believe I... Uh, yes, the report moves. is before you, and so I'm open to people ask questions, if that's right. That's fine. There are now questions to the Deputy Leader on his report. There's ten minutes for questions, and uh, the Deputy Leader may carry on as before. Okay. Um, Councillor Carr. Thank you, Lord Mayor. <clears throat> um, I just want to comment that, as articulated by the Leader just now, yeah. I'm surprised that with 50% of the vote between you and the Greens, you still feel it necessary to be supported by a citizens' assembly, uh, an unelected assembly, probably York City's equivalent of the House of Lords, maybe. My question to the Deputy Leader is this. He's been leader of the Green Group for some considerable time, and probably a member of the Green Party for considerably longer. He must have a cornucopia of exciting, radical green policies <laughs> sitting there on the shelf, just begging to be implemented. Can you name one? 
Thank you, Lona. Uh, thank you, um, Councillor Carr. I um, think I should say that uh, that uh, list, is, as you say, is very long, um, but uh, politics is the art of the possible. So it's a question of putting forward proposals, working with colleagues to implement them. So I'm sure you'll be able to pick, your, pick those you like from the list that we're going to vote on later on tonight. In our budget. Thank you. Councillor Baker. Oh, no, sorry. Oh, what did you have a supplementary? <laughs> well, if I'm I did have so a supplementary, sorry. was it is this. Was that an answer? I, well, I could talk about walking and cycling. I could talk about highways. I could talk about any number of things which are in that, that budget proposal, which we're going to debate later. Yes, it was. <laughs> Has anybody else got a supplementary on that particular question? No? Right, we move on. So, Councillor Baker. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, could you reassure us about some of the actions that will be taken to improve the cycle infrastructure and road safety for cyclists using the money that's been allocated in the budget and especially in light of the two deaths in the past week on our roads. Thank you, Councillor Baker. Um, it is sad, very sad to acknowledge that uh, our roads are not as safe as we would like to see. Um, and that is one of the reasons why um, one of the proposals in our uh, budget is for a million pounds investment in walking and cycling. Now, as we'll discuss later, um, the situation with uh, the, fu the funding for our highways, um, one could uh, put significant amounts in and still feel that there was many things that needed to be implemented. But nevertheless, I would very much hope that in conjunction with the cycle campaign and the organisations that spoke this evening um, and with war councillors, we could identify some key measures uh, in, in very quickly that we could put in place would actually improve safety uh, for cyclists and pedestrians in the city, could actually st start that step change that we need in transport in terms of making it more attractive for the healthy, active travel option of walking and cycling to be the preference for, for more people and not to be dependent on uh, cars which except uh, any of you who own and run a car will know it's not the sort of necessarily the choice first choice you would make uh, it's an expense it's something that people feel they have to do because of inadequate infrastructure in our city to actually enable them to get from where they want to be to where they need to where, where they live to where they want to be um, and and to get about in a, in a more healthy and active way Thank you. Is there a supplementary on that, Councillor Crawshaw? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, that's really good to hear, and I'm sure that um, the Labour Group would be welcoming any investment in the cycling infrastructure. It certainly was something that um, we were putting forward in our manifesto. Specifically, though, um, as you are well aware, there's been an um, issue which affects your ward and my ward uh, in terms of the Terry Avenue closure for the necessary flood defences. And one of the things that I think has really upset a lot of the cyclists is um, it's brought into very sharp focus the lack of uh, good cycling infrastructure in that part of the city. And I think the cycle route on the opposite bank of the river is a, a useful diversion, but it's shown how poor the, that part of the cycle route is when you reach Skeldergate Bridge. Now, when you're thinking about your investment in cycle infrastructure, can I implore you to prioritise something around that part of the infrastructure such that if there is going to be a closure at Terry Avenue, the mitigation measures can be put in place for the duration of that project, but actually leave the cycle infrastructure in a much better place once Terry Avenue is reopened again. Well, as you as you well know, I have been very involved in the discussions about that uh, situation with Terry Avenue having to be closed or potentially having to be closed for up to 18 months in order to have uh, essential flood defence works carried out. And the situation we have in York, inevitably, the Environment Agency, if they're putting in flood protection works, that's going to be along the riverbank, and that inevitably, uh, it seems, in our, in our city at least, is where a lot of the walking and cycling routes are focused, because they're away from the traffic, they're more uh, level, attractive routes 
that uh, people can use. So we do need to look at those, but we also need to have a more strategic view in the long term about joining up those networks. Um, and uh, as you will probably know, we may discuss at another point in time, the, the Castle Gateway uh, program that has within it um, a, a, a means of getting a, a pedestrian cycle route, a super crossing to get across the River Foss uh, from the Castle, um, car, the, from the St George's Field car park uh, to Piccadilly and into the heart of the city. And it's measures like that that we need to be looking at where there are opportunities to link up the um, off-road networks that exist to where people want to go. So to key destinations like the hospital schools, uh, workplaces, but we need to have a continuous link, not just as, well, as soon as it gets difficult, the route runs out, which is what's tended to happen uh, in the past. Councillor Oral. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, Councillor Gorner, I read with interest your uh, remarks about the anti-idling campaign. Um, having lived in, in a house for a year in proximity to many uh, idling vehicles, I actually told some of them if they turned their engines off occasionally, politely of course. Can you tell us more about the, the campaign that uh, you're about to? Certainly. Um, well, as, as people may be aware, the last a couple of years, um, Clean Air Day in, in the 20th of June, um, has been an opportunity for this city, along with other places around the country, to highlight the need for people to focus on clean air and the air pollution, which kills many people prematurely in this city because of the pollution, which is mostly from traffic. And uh, so the initiative that we've taken already as part of the working towards a, a bus-based clean air zone, which comes in next, into effect next year, is to encourage drivers to be aware of the need to switch their engines off, not just any, any drivers, but particularly uh, those who are driving diesel vehicles because of the particulates that they emit. Uh, and that includes all bus operators, which is why you'll see around the city now, after quite a lot of campaigning in the last couple of years, um, as uh, some councillors will be aware, uh, we have now got at least some signage to remind drivers at timing points or places where they're going to be waiting for any length of time to switch their engines off. Hopefully that will not be an issue in the future for many more buses because next year, uh, well from November, uh, many of the park and ride buses will be uh, transferring over to electrically operated, um, which obviously removes the problem. So it's a coordinated approach, awareness raising, um, not just about bus drivers, but also um, people who are picking up, waiting to pick, collect children from school, um, people who maybe stop to answer their phone, all those sorts of occasions are an opportunity, delivery drivers and so on, they're all an opportunity to switch the engine off, save some money on your fuel bill, and also to help the environment for people who are immediately around that vehicle. <coughs> uh, Councillor Barnes. Sorry to take a moment there. I just remember there is no Councillor Neil Barnes anymore. So it's no, just I know, it's just um, you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, at the planning meeting, planning committee meeting on the 25th of March, uh, you said that the York Central development, if implemented as proposed, would be, and I quote, an absolute nightmare for the city. Uh, you went on to say that we'll rue the day that we approved this application with the measures as they are in terms of traffic impacts for the city. As uh, councillor for Acre, I wholeheartedly concur, it's going to cause terrible congestion for, for that part of the city. So I guess my question is, um, you've described politics as the art of the possible. One, what's your early stage assessment of what might be possible in terms of change? Two, what actions are you taking to deliver that change? And three, will you work with us and, and help reach out and build a consensus for the low car development on that site, which I know you would like to see? Thank you. For, you've reminded me. For, uh, you obviously have better recall or the opportunity to look at the webcast to remind me of what I said. Um, certainly, as has been already stated, there is a paper coming to the executive tomorrow which sets out a number of measures that the new administration is looking to see improvements on the uh, 
the overall sustainability of the development. So it is very much a case of, as you said, the art of the possible, but we are putting in place a number of, um, uh, identi identifying a number of um, issues, whether it's design of the buildings, the uh, transport implications and so on, but we want to work with, very much work with the partners, as, as has been said, we, we very much need to secure the funding for what is uh, intended. We needed the access into there. There's obviously a lot of infrastructure that needs to go in, but it is an opportunity for us to um, raise awareness about sustainability. And from, from my point of view, I very much will be w uh, wanting to get over the message to any uh, developers who might be looking to relocate um, to a, such a sustainable location right next to the, the station, the public transport infrastructure which we will have in place is I mean, an opportunity for a 21st century low car development as you say. And we need to work together to actually convince all the partners that that is not only going to be in the interest of the environment, it also makes business sense to reduce the congestion which is a consequence of that development and to make it more attractive for people who want an attractive and sustainably located um, a place for their business to operate from. So very much we need to engage with the occupier strategy, with the partnership, with network, you know, network rail, National Railway Museum. They're all big organisations which have sustainable transport at the heart of what they're about. We need to actually convince them that this makes sense in terms of the way we, we develop out the uh, site uh, with the reserve matters applications as they come forward. Thank you, Councillor de Gaulle. That concludes the question session for the um, Deputy Leader of the Council. It seems an opportune moment to call a comfort break before we embark on the next stage of the agenda. So I will take 10 minutes, quarter past eight. We shall resume business. Um, the
papers and has been referred to by the um, group leader, the council leader and the deputy. Um, we have a budget amendment on the agenda paper. My desire is, as chair of this council, to provide sufficient time for it to be adequately debated. It, in some ways, it's probably the most significant item we have on this agenda. So my proposal is in discussion with the council leader and the deputy, is that we will go straight through the motions on notice, um, as at item eight, and then I will vary the agenda to bring forward the proposal for the amend budget amendment, and we will take that round about 9.15, 9.30. So if you're very focused, if you're very organized, if you don't waste time, we should be able to get through the motions and have a proper debate on the budget amendment. So can we go straight into motion number one, Councillor Crawshaw to move the first motion which relates to York as a carbon neutral city. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. I will uh, try to speak as quick as I can without rushing. Um, so I'm proposing this uh, motion which seeks to address one of the key issues our city will face during this administration and beyond, that of climate change and how we can, in practical terms, become a carbon neutral city. When, car when Council declared a climate emergency in March, I and many others welcomed that decision but cautioned that words are easy. If we're genuine in our intention, we must be prepared to back up those words with actions, some of which might be challenging and others downright difficult. And nowhere is that more evident than when we look at how, how our city will develop over the coming years. We live in a beautiful city. I love living in York. But it's a city that is not particularly accessible, and many of the attributes that make it so pleasing on the eye also make it an inefficient, high-carbon, sometimes awkward place to live, work, and particularly to get around. It's an ancient city that doesn't always lend itself to 21st century living. The difficulties presented by the historic core, alongside the relative paucity of cycling infrastructure in the wider city and the somewhat meagre public transport options, are by no means insurmountable. But they do make it absolutely vital that any new developments, particularly those at scale, are not simply adequate for the modern world, not just better even, they must be exemplary developments. If we, as a city, are to meet the challenges of the 21st century, new developments in York must address and, if needs be, compensate for the difficulties we face elsewhere. They're going to have to be net contributors to reaching our carbon neutral goal. But that's not what we're doing at the moment. We've been discussing York Central already as a case in point. The largest development we're likely to see in our lifetimes in a completely sustainable location Yet we're cramping 2,500 houses on there, a huge multi-storey car park, an insufficient amount of green space, and a trunk road through the middle, which we've accepted will create upwards of 1,200 cars an hour at peak times, along with the high likelihood of cars stacking as they wait to access the Marble Arch Tunnel. We have actually designed in congestion at the moment. And this despite public protection colleagues cautioning that, and I quote, the introduction of additional traffic arising from the development will reduce the rate of expected air quality improvement around the city. If we are serious about addressing the climate emergency that we face, we have to demand and deliver better. Now, those of us who sat on the planning know how difficult that can be. The, the, the option to shape the type of developments that we want to see in York, the, the odds are stacked against us. They're stacked in the favour of developers and we often sit there thinking common sense says we need this outcome, but actually the legislative tools don't allow for that, so we're going to have to go with that one, even if we know that it's not the right one. This motion is asking us to redress some of that imbalance as a matter of urgency, because there are legislative tools that we could employ, so long as they were updated to reflect our ambitions. Supplementary planning documents, SPDs, give the legal underpinning to any conditions we might wish to set, they're what make conditions enforceable and can prevent their imposition being overturned at appeal. SPDs sit alongside the local plan. They carry weight even when that plan is in draft. And crucially for us, those SPDs can be amended at any time, subject, obviously, to meeting the requirements for doing so. Councillor de Gaunt's Deputy Leader's report talks about responding effectively to the climate emergency and the need to identify quick-win measures. 
Well, amending the SPDs might not be the very quickest win, but it would certainly be an effective response, and any amendments needn't take long to achieve, so long as the political will is there to do so. At the dawn of the 20th century, York led the way in innovative development through construction of the first ever garden village at New Earswick. Later in the 30s, Tang Hall set the blueprint for modern council housing, and in the 1980s, we created foot streets across a whole swathe of our city centre. In essence, what I'm proposing is that we proactively seek to lead the way again. We must embrace low-car development, facilitating access, but increasing opportunities for walking and cycling wherever possible. We must demand high standards of design and construction in both the public and the private realm. And in doing so, by putting York at the forefront of delivering truly innovative 21st century housing, employment space, and transport infrastructure, we can set a bar for what it means to live in a modern, low-carbon, people-friendly city. Yeah. Secondary, are you, do, do you wish to speak? Yes, please. Come on, then. Right, thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm very happy to second this motion. Um, the Council agreed almost unanimously that we need to make York carbon neutral by 2030. Um, it's a huge task, but we need to find ways of doing it. Um, as well as that, I think we can probably all agree that York has a traffic congestion problem. Uh, Over-reliance on cars means that journey times are longer for everyone, including people on buses, um, and for people who rely on their cars for mobility reasons and other reasons. Um, traffic, particularly congested traffic, is also a huge polluter. Um, the council's own website acknowledges the link between air pollution and asthma attacks, lung cancer, and even heart attacks. So we need to take more action against air pollution, and we need to do it urgently. Um, a good way to try and tackle both these issues, carbon emissions and congestion, is planning policy. Um, houses have quite a large carbon footprint that can be quite easily reduced, and the nature of people's housing and their neighbourhoods influences their decisions on whether to drive or cycle or walk. Um, a survey a few years ago found that um, one of the top five reasons why people choose not to cycle is because they don't have anywhere to leave their bike at home. Um, if you don't have anywhere safe to leave your bike, then you can't have a bike reasonably. It's not like with cars, a bicycle can't really be left on the road safely. Um, current planning guidance says that um, new houses built in York should have um, off-road off provision for one car and one bicycle. But a car can usually carry five people, and a bicycle only one. It can't carry a household. And as the council, we can't ensure that houses built in York have adequate provision for cyclists unless we update the, um, the supplementary planning documents. Um, we need to update them as quickly as possible uh, to improve cycling provision, to ensure that all houses are built with sustainable material and to sustainable designs. Uh, this is particularly important, obviously, with large developments. York has a few big developments coming up, the largest of which uh, is York Central, which is in the ward that I represent. Um, York Central is a really exciting opportunity to create good jobs and the affordable, sustainable housing that we need. The, uh, the houses and infrastructure built on York Central will be there for decades, well past 2030. So the plans for York Central need to be part of our plan to be carbon neutral by 2030. York Central needs to be built suitable for the future. At the moment, the plans for York Central are not low car, they are not carbon neutral, so we need to update the supplementary planning documents so that we can add the necessary amendments to ensure that York Central and all other housing built in York is sustainable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Melly. Um, I now invite debate on the motion. Each member has three minutes. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, well, I welcome this motion. It's a beginning of a, what I hope to be a constructive approach from the Labour Group to the York Central development. Um, and I would commend um, looking at Chapter 9 of the Planning Guide. There is a lot contained within that which has an opportunity for this council and in particular planning committees to ensure that it does become <coughs> that exemplar which the partners say they would like and I'm sure we all 
want it to be. Um, there, there was a raft of policies which looked at cycling types of um, car use um, to minimise that, and things have progressed. Um, one of the features uh, that Councillor Fenton particularly enjoys living with me is that I collect old documents. Um, and the, the York Central planning brief from 2002 was merely uh, aiming to meet a 20% modal target for drivers arriving at work by car. So I think we've come quite away from that. Um, but there is a long way to go. So in terms of working with um, groups, uh, we met with Clean Air York, York Bus Forum, um, York Central Action, York Cycle Campaign, Civic Trust, and York Environment Forum. And I thought that was a very productive meeting. So I was disappointed by the way in which that meeting had been portrayed. Um, because we were asked to explore ways in which minor adjustments could be made and I hope that you will work with us on developing the reserve matters aspects which will ensure that developers understand that higher standards will be expected here which will then demonstrate to the city that it is feasible, possible and there is still a business case for it. It is over 10 years since um, Housing Associate, York Housing Association um, built Passive House, and therefore in the intervening period, perhaps we should have demonstrated that that was a greater way of um, ensuring an expectation. But that Passive House is contained within that, so I would urge you to read through that, and that where you have the opportunity, you are ensuring that this is delivered um, and I'm delighted to see many more physicists around to help in demonstrating the need for the evidence base for all of this work. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. <coughs> um, Councillor Vassy. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I've been gone for a while, now I'm back. I've been listening with interest and I'd like to start by using the words of JFK at the start of the moon race, since we're celebrating this week, 50 years of men walking on the moon. We choose to tackle climate change, I'm paraphrasing. We choose to tackle climate change in this decade and do the other thing. Not because it is easy, but because it is hard. Because that goal will serve to organize the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win. I was really proud that in March of this year, you all signed up to a climate emergency declaration. It gives us power we haven't had before. When I was on the council before, I saw all the prevarication, all the inability to get things done, all the mediocrity, all the attempts, all the will, but not the implementation. We now have the opportunity, thanks to you, to have a climate change committee. And with that committee, we have the opportunity to work and show the city, to show businesses, to show council officers, to show residents, that we speak with one voice. I think that's what has been missing for far too long at this city. There are hundreds of cities that are way ahead of us, if we're honest about this. I think of Barnstadt, the passive house development in Heidelberg, the largest passive house development in Europe. They've managed to achieve that on 60 hectares of, wait for it, their old railway goods yards. They managed to transform their goods yards and create an exemplar of sustainable construction and have it finished while we're still talking about how to start. I believe we can deliver all of that. We just need to show less timidity. We need to show more confidence. We need to show the fact that we know that if we create something great, if we create a fantastic design, money follows good ideas. We know that business will follow good ideas. That's what they found in Bernstadt. But in order to achieve, 
We now need to speak with one voice. I think we've been picked off for far too long. I think we've never given a clarity of purpose to council officers, to our city, to anyone else that we all mean to change. I think if we can do that, if we can agree a 10-year plan that will move us all the way from here to 2030 so that it really doesn't matter anymore who's in power, we've all signed up to it, then we can achieve. I think that we ought seconds. to make sure every no, year... No, less we than all, 30 seconds. You. Yes, Lord Mayor, I think every year we ought to all sign that, that declaration, that report on where we're going, regardless of who's in power, so that we all take ownership and we use all the energies and skills that are around this room. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Waters. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, there is, of course, one simple, practical way of avoiding further traffic congestion, further concerns of a air quality, further concerns of a loss of a green infrastructure, and that is to stop promoting the development of excessive levels of housing in York. And with that, I would refer members, because it's not just my view, to the independent report from the Local Government Association that came out on the 1st of July, which I've referred to the Executive Member for Transport and Planning, and requested that it goes on the agenda for the next local plan working group meeting. York's delivering enough housing. York's exceeding the delivery targets of the rest of the country. It's about time this council stood up to a government that is pushing larger and larger targets for housing on an old historic city that cannot and will not cope with it in years to come. That's the real elephant in the room that nobody will address. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Um, I have no more speakers who've signalled. So, Councillor Crawshaw, do you want to reply? Just very briefly, um, sounds as though we've got a lot of support in the room. As I said in my uh, speech, passing a motion is easy. It's the following through on the resolutions that matters. So I would urge Executive to, if we are passing this motion, seek to amend the SPDs as rapidly as we can. And tomorrow night, when Executive were asked expressly to delegate authority to the Director of Economy and Place in consultation with the Leader of the uh, Council to submit this uh, reserved matters application, um, I would like us as a Council to give a very clear steer to the Leader and to the uh, Executive... Uh, sorry, I've forgotten his title. <laughs> but. Uh, what we want from that reserved matters application is to reflect this ambition and to really make sure that we are delivering on what we are saying rather than just speaking hot air. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will now take a vote on the motion. Please raise your hands when I ask to indicate whether you wish to vote for and then against or abstain. So can I see those in favour of the, the motion? Please show. I think we have got... Perfect. That's, that's unanimous, so that's fine. That's wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. Um, second motion, a fair deal for York. Uh, and before we take the motion, um, members will note that they have been provided with details of a slight alteration to the original motion. Uh, the leader wishes to seek council's consent, understanding order 27.1, to alter his motion as has been circulated around the chamber. So before we discuss the motion or take proposals, can council indicate whether they will accept the proposed alteration, please? Great. And can I just remind members that when we give a deadline for amendments, that deadline means something, and it does not mean that it comes in two days afterwards. So we may not be so nice next time. I now um, I invite Councillor Aston to formally move the motion as altered. Thank you, uh, Lord Mayor. It's quite tempting to, to entirely take credit for the, the additional uh, bullet point, but, but as you uh, say, uh, I agree with the, the, the Labour group to, to add it onto the resolved section of the, the motion and ha happy to do so. Um, I'm pleased to be proposing our fair deal motion this evening 
as this is a campaign that Liberal Democrats in, in York and, and, and other groups have long been calling for and something we feel this council should continuously lobby the government on. <coughs> it's fair to say that colleagues from all parties recognise that government investment in the north of England and the city of York has been inadequate, particularly when compared to other regions. And in spite of progress being made here in York and other northern cities such as Leeds and Manchester, the once crown jewels of the Industrial Revolution, we have seen decades of slower growth and lower productivity when compared to regions in the south. For York, many of our services remain at the very bottom of government funding tables. For example, schools in York remain the worst funded in the country for per pupil funding. York CCG continues to operate with a large deficit and investment in York from the Humber's transport infrastructure significantly lags behind London and the South East. The quality of transport links has been and remains a critical factor in this disparity. More recently, more than 20 media outlets based in the north of England have come together, including local media here in York, to call on the government to commit to a package of policy measures which would power up the north. And as leader of the council, I felt it was important to endorse and support this campaign this evening, and I would like the Council to collectively endorse the Power Up the North campaign by supporting this motion. Fair funding is not just a generic call on the Government. Some councils have already set out comprehensive plans and alternative formulas to distribute Government funding. For example, Leicestershire County Council's model shows that York could receive an additional £30 million per year for public services if the funding formula were to take need and demographics more into account. With significant amounts of EU structural funding due to drop out, now is the time for the Government to give the North of England and York a fairer deal and ensure that services are funded based on need. The upcoming spending review, uh, when and if it happens now or in the distant future, um, should be an opportunity for the Government to commit to address this imbalance and this Council should be following in the steps of other Councils like Leicestershire to work hard to lobby the Government. I hope that all members support the motion tonight. Thank you. May I have a seconder? I reserve the right, Lord Mayor. Thank you. The matter is now open to debate. Uh, Councillor Claire Douglas, and then I think it was Councillor Rowley. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'd like to thank the leader for incorporating our um, amendment to the motion. Um, it's something that we wholeheartedly believe in. York can no longer be at the bottom of the list for funding nationally, and we all need to do something about it. Um, we think that the central government should take its full responsibility to fund the most vulnerable in our society, our children's services and elder care. And also, though, I'd like to remind everybody that unfortunately, even though this is a Lib Dem national campaign, the Lib Dems were in uh, government over the years 2010 to 15, when we lost 100 million from the City of York Council budget out of our annual budget, and also we've lost 1,000 staff since that point. So let's not forget that this isn't a straightforward story. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Rowley. Thank you, Lord Mayor. It's a huge honour and privilege to rise to make my first speech at full council. It's a long uh, learning experience. Much of it is good and uh, some of it less so, as I find my feet as a councillor. I'll endeavour to serve my residents as best I can, but I know that this will cut little mustard with yourself, Lord Mayor, for whom we have been told Shakespeare is the true language in which you speak. Therefore, I set out a truer context of how my time as a councillor may go. Hopefully, it will be as Shakespeare said, some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. However, I am, of course, aware that his quote, I would give all my fame for a spot of ale and safety, may in my case be truer. Turning to the motion, I believe it is the view of every party that York's health service and education need more funding. I know that it's the view of myself and Councillor Doherty. It was the view of the Conservative group last term and in terms before, and it is of the York Outer MP Julian Sturdy. Of course, for much of the period referred to, the Liberal Democrats were in national power and taking decisions while doing nothing to address these funding issues. This motion damns the Conservative government 
whose cuts local uh, Liberal Democrats always criticise. I don't understand, and nor do my residents, why to York Liberal Democrats, funding decisions by the Conservative Liberal Democrat Coalition were fine, but an identical direction of travel without the Liberal Democrats in government is profoundly wrong. Unless, of course, it is political posturing. Lord Mayor, surely not. Lord Mayor, I want to be a councillor to improve people's lives and sadly this motion looks like pure political rhetoric and posturing rather than anything tangible. I was warned about the absurd waste of time that motions in the council chamber could be and sadly I see this is one. Every, everything is about more money or greater priorities without any hint whatever about what is needed and where the money is going to come from. It's the same campaign that we've seen from the Liberal Democrats in numerous areas, including fire, ambulance, devolution, schools, and the police. Never any detail or substance, just a supposedly concerned photo and press release. We've just had a motion from Councillor Crawshaw, which makes a sensible, tangible suggestion on one I was happy to support. And later we'll have a motion from Councillor Taylor, about which I feel the same. However, this is not the case with this motion. I'll abstain on this motion, as we know this motion will achieve nothing except a few more Lib Democrat leaflets go out saying what they called for. If we want to achieve things for York, we need to work together, not posture alone. Thank you very much. I was just about to call a halt. Where am I now? Councillor Culwick. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I will speak briefly. You'll be pleased to know. But I did want to say something because I do feel passionately about this and find it something I speak regularly about with residents who see the injustice of funding for this city and see that in very practical terms. And only last month the Institute of Public Policy Research said that although the economy had, quotes, moved in the right direction, the Tory government had, again quotes, undermined the northern powerhouse by making cuts to public spending. So over the last five years, for example, as we all have seen, weekly pay across the north has risen by £12 against the national average of an increase of £19. Another reflection of underinvestment in this region is the effectiveness of our railways. We see this in the number of cancelled and significantly late trains. For example, on the Trans Pennine Express and Northern franchises, the number of cancelled or late trains more than doubled, from 20,000 in 2014-15 to 47,000 in 2018-19. That's almost one in every 20 services. This government may point to success in terms of devolved power with regional mayors, but we know the perception of people living here in York is that the pledge made by George Osborne in 2014 has not been turned into action. The government must look to the north of England and our region as an asset to be invested in. And I feel it's fundamental that as councillors of all parties here in York, that once again we find that with this motion we can speak with one very clear, very loud voice, demanding that the government release greater funding for the north, for our region and for York. A fairer deal and a greater investment so that we can provide additional funding for our schools, so bitterly and tragically underfunded. Additional funding for our health and care hubs, and much needed investment in Northern Powerhouse Rail. I am confident the members will support this motion. Thank you very much. I've had no other indications to speak. Um, Councillor Aston, do you wish to reply? Thank you, uh, Lord Mayor. Just briefly to, to thank the, the, the Labour Group for their amendment and their support for the, the campaign and, and, and fair funding. I, I agree with uh, what Councillor Colwick has, has outlined. I have to say I'm extremely disappointed, although welcoming the new Conservative councillor, uh, that given that you said in your speech that you supported additional funding for schools and health services, which are the first two bullet points, by abstaining, what you're not doing is supporting that Northern Powerhouse Rail is made a national priority and not supporting that the shared prosperity fund is devolved so that local areas and regions can decide 
how it's spent. So actually, you're the only one who's deciding on a political basis why not to support things that I'm sure you do actually agree with. Um, and it goes back to Councillor Colwick's point. It's a real opportunity to support the Power Up the North campaign uh, and the point being continuously uh, lobby together to, to get that uh, investment into the future. So I hope uh, that, that everybody except Councillor Rowley can, can support that. Thank you. I will now take a vote on the altered motion. Please raise your hands when I ask um, to indicate whether you wish to vote for the motion. Please, can I see those in favour of the motion? And I think, just for clarity, just for clarity can I have any abstentions? Yep. I think that is clearly a vote for that motion. We now move to the third motion on the paper, the, from Councillor Fenton on long-term empty properties in York. Councillor Fenton. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I'm pleased to put forward this motion to Council this evening as, it's, it's, as it is important that the Council does all it can to bring empty homes back, in, back into use and help ease the pressure on York's housing market. It's no secret that for many people in York, it's increasingly difficult to set up a home in the city. And whilst the council has embarked on the largest house building program in the city since the 1970s, and is striving to get a local plan approved, there are more levers that the council can use to try to increase the supply of homes. Introducing financial incentives to encourage property owners to bring long-term empty properties back into use is one such lever. Nationally, the data available suggests that there are currently 200,000 properties standing empty in England, and in 2017 the figure for York was 527. Every one of those long-term empty properties in the city represents a wasted opportunity for future residents to find a home. Many members will know from, from their own wards that long-term empty properties can be a blight on, on local communities in terms of att attracting antisocial behaviour, and contributing to a, a general area of neglect. The Council can help bring empty homes back into use through a variety of measures, including providing assistance to owners to help refurbish these properties. However, one of the most important tools in the Council's armoury is to charge a Council tax premium on long-term empty homes, so that owners have a financial incentive to bring that property back into use. Since April 2013, national legislation has allowed local authorities in England to charge a premium of 50% on the full council tax charge. And in November 2018, it was agreed that a 100% premium can be charged. From April 2021, the rules will change again so that councils will be able to charge a 100% premium on properties that have been empty for up to five years, 200% on properties that have been empty for over five years, and 300% on properties that have been empty for more than 10 years. It's important to point out that local authorities do have a large amount of discretion in these arrangements. Um, and when thinking about how we would want to make use of those powers, I would hope and expect <clears throat> the council to use a degree um, of, of, of pragmatism and common sense, so that where there are properties that are uh, left empty for a short period of time, for example, following the, um, the death of a resident or someone who'd been temporarily moved into uh, into, into a care setting that uh, there would be a pragmatic approach as I'm sure the council would want, would want to take. Uh, there is however an opportunity here for the council to take advantage of these strengthened legal powers to help to reduce the number of long-term empty properties in the city. In doing so and combined with the work on the housing delivery programme, York Central and the local plan, we can strengthen our efforts to address the shortage of housing and in particular affordable housing in the city. I hope, therefore, that members will support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fenton. Do I have a seconder? Do you wish to speak? Thank you, Lord Mayor, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm pleased to second this motion tonight and take the opportunity to speak for the first time at Council. As my colleague Councillor Fenton has already underlined, it is so important that the Council uses the powers it has available to help people buy or rent in our city and bring over 500 long-term empty properties back into domestic use. 
this is the size, obviously, of a large housing development. Uh, I'm not going to do much detail regarding the council tax element, as Councillor Fenton has already outlined, although I do feel it is incredibly important the council charges the highest premium on empty properties as soon as the legislation permits. However, I would like to focus on the other important services the council can offer to help bring empty properties back into use. Across the UK, cities have seen an increase in the number of empty properties, and typically this has been a result of a strong construction market with many homes bought for resale or let. Currently, to address this, the council offers a variety of services to all owners of empty homes so that they can overcome barriers to help them refurbish, sell or let the properties to be much needed homes. So this can include loans which are available from the council for those, who want, those owners who want to bring a suboptimal property back to living standards and some owners can receive advice from the council in the form of an appraisal to identify improvements that can be made. So I'm advised that 17 long-term empty homes were brought back into use through these actions uh, during the last year but with the, in the increase in the number of empty homes over recent years and the increasing popularity of short-term lets, such as Airbnb, there is a need to drive those numbers down. That's why, in addition to the council tax charge, this motion also calls for officers to identify new options to proactively bring homes back into use. So with this in mind, I hope that members support this motion and take the opportunity to call for a more pragmatic and expedient approach to reducing the number of empty properties across our wonderful city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's now open for debate. Can I see anybody who wishes to speak? Councillor Hook, is that right? Councillor Fenton and Councillor Pearson have already discussed the key points and the benefits of this action. Because the subject of empty homes is an important one and such a key component of making more homes available in the city, I should like to add, a, make a small contribution to this debate. I would strongly support the council levying the highest council tax possible on long-term empty properties as it was Liberal Democrats in the House of Lords who amended government policy to set in place an escalator, escalator of council tax charges. Therefore, the longer a property is left empty, the more council tax would have to be paid. With many people unable to afford a home of their own or stuck in temporary accommodation, it's only right that the council takes this course of action. In fact, Local authorities should be given more powers to help bring empty homes back into use and allow the opportunity to charge beyond the proposed 300% charge to ensure these properties come back into use. By taking proper action on empty homes, we can utilise their resource to help support families or individuals into a home and also prevent empty properties from becoming a blight on the local community. Therefore, I hope that members support the motion. Thank you. Councillor Crawshaw. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I feel like I've been a bit up and down tonight, but um, just wanted to make a couple of very quick points. Um, Labour Group will be supporting um, this motion. Um, we did have a little concern about the wording of the second bullet point, which uh, talks about empty properties attracting squatters and then conflates that with vandalism and antisocial behaviour. And of course, a lot of people who are squatting are there because they can't afford to be in uh, other housing. And um, it seems to us that it deflects somewhat from the real scandal, which is then rightly mentioned in the next bullet point, which is actually that those empty houses should be being brought back into use for uh, families and, and other people who are on the housing waiting list. And of course, we would also like to make the point that actually we do have powers to do that already. Uh, compulsory purchase orders could be used. We've only used them once in the last two years. And, uh, you know, we're all in favour of having more powers to bring more homes into use, but let's also think about using the powers that we have. The final point that I wanted to make is the scandal which is not mentioned in this uh, motion, and that's the scandal of there being around 30 homes in York <coughs> or available to York, two-bed flats that were built under 106 agreements as affordable houses that are located in properties where there are service charges 
and when you add the combination of the service charge with the council tax, they become unaffordable for those who are on the waiting list for housing in the city. So I think we ought to also be looking at whether or not the provision of affordable housing and how we actually deliver that is being addressed properly as well. It's a, a note that's missing from this motion, but as I say, we will be supporting the motion. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Waters. <coughs> Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, well, given the thrust of this motion, I'd just like to challenge the proposer and all of the members over the effects of properties at the other end of the spectrum from empty properties. Empty properties of which, according to the motion, there's 527 in York. And that is in regard to over-occupied houses of multiple occupancy, specifically non-council taxpaying student HMOs, of which there are thousands in this city. Will the new administration commit to lobbying government for a change in the law to allow council tax or business rates to be levied on student-let properties. Following changes to revenue support grant, this current, and listen to this figure, £6.2 million cost falls squarely on this council to meet, or more correctly, on the council taxpayers of York to meet. And further to this motion highlighting empty private residential property, Will the new administration commit to dealing with the similar scandal of empty York Council properties, both commercial and residential? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you very much. Councillor Craghill. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, first of all, I just want to say I'm very happy to support this motion um, and indeed to pick it up and take it forward over the coming months in my portfolio capacity. Um, I'm aware that the issue of empty properties is something that a great many residents in York are concerned about, and quite rightly so. Clearly, any property uh, that is standing empty for any length of time represents an opportunity to bring another home back into use for York residents. I just wanted to add, though, that it is important that we start off this work by getting very clear uh, which properties are actually empty. Officers believe that an element of the reported increase in York um, is actually linked or may well be linked to the introduction of a new national recording system which doesn't involve an actual visit and physical confirmation the property is still empty. Um, and, um, so although we've had, when we've done local audits in the past of properties recorded as empty 12 to 18 months earlier, um, we have then found that 40% of those are actually occupied during that period of time. So at present, since we don't have a recent local audit, I have been talking to officers, and if we pass this motion, um, what we want to look at is making sure that we do carry out a local audit um, so that whatever actions we take in future um, to, to address this issue are based on, on detailed local, local evidence. Um, just to respond to the issue of the service charges, I'm aware that that is also an issue and something that we need to look at and look at all the options uh, wherever we can to, to get over that, that problem. Thank you. Please support the motion. Thank you very much. Are there any other speakers? Then I will ask Councillor Fenton if he wishes to use his right of reply. Um. <clears throat> just to thank members for their, for their comments and their support, and I uh, thank you to Councillor Craghill for um, agreeing to pick up <clears throat> um, a couple of the issues that Councillor Croshaw raised in terms of service charges and um, uh, compulsory purchase. Looking through, if anyone gets a chance, there's a very, a very good House of Commons library briefing on empty homes, which was fairly recently published, um, which has got some good stuff in there, not least from... Uh, Action on Empty Homes, which is a national charity that has done a lot of work and a lot of research. Um, I welcome Councillor Craghill's um, kind of investigation into the, the real picture in York. Action on Empty Homes believes that the number of empty homes for which we have data could be an underestimate because it relies on council tax returns. Uh, there may be properties where <clears throat> owners haven't declared uh, a premises to be empty, so we may find that the picture is different once we do some local investigative work. Um, just very <laughs> briefly, one, one, one interesting factoid 
uh, I picked up was a, a quote from June 2014 where uh, a certain Boris Johnson, when he was Mayor of London, uh, was quoted as saying he would like to see a change in, in the law to allow councils to impose a 1,000% council tax premium. So, so maybe when, if mm -hmm. as and when um, Mr Johnson uh, ascends to power, we'll see this um, sort of a swing towards massive state intervention that uh, perhaps we wouldn't have otherwise <laughs> expected of him. Um, but thank you, members, for your, for your comments and your support. Thank you very much. I will now take a vote on the motion. So please raise your hands when I indicate to say whether you wish to support the motion. Please show. I think we've got that one. There weren't any abstentions on this one, were there? No. Okay, thank you very much. We now move on to Motion number four, a pollinator action plan. Um, I will now invite Councillor Dave Taylor to formally move the fourth and final motion. Um, I'm hoping that he will enlighten me hugely. It sounds almost obscene, but I presume it isn't. So if you can um, tell us and support the motion. It's all about the birds and the bees, Lord Mayor. <laughs> I had, I had considered taking up your challenge to do this in song, but so far I've only written the lyrics. You can hum along if you like, like a bee. Wildflowers then, um, who doesn't love them? Well, maybe some people who suffer from hay fever, but that's about it. This is the topic of our times. We're hitting the zeitgeist tonight. Every glossy magazine in the Sunday papers appears to have an article on the decline of wildflower meadows and the loss of biodiversity. Last Friday's Gardener's Question Time on BBC Two was devoted to discussing the restoration of our diminishing wildflower meadows. Even Councillor Pavlovich and former Councillor Neil Barnes have got in on the act with a lovely photo of daffodils on Hull Road. But it's not just a question of making our city look pretty. Indeed, wildflower-rich grasslands can look rather untidy at certain times of the year. And it's not even about saving money. York is unlikely to save £93,000 like Dorset, a, a rural county council, but we could save money in the longer term, even if we require some capital investment to begin with. The real crux of the matter then. Wildflower meadows are part of Britain's natural heritage, but a scientific survey published in 1986 declared that since the Second World War, and primarily due to the intensification of farming, 97% of wildflower meadows in England and Wales have been destroyed. We are witnessing the loss of biodiversity at rates never before seen in human history. Of course, this loss of biodiversity and even species extinction, as mentioned in the motion, is not limited to wildflowers. Just like the flowers that they feed upon, insect pollinators are in trouble, with one third of the UK's wild bee and hoverfly species showing declines in their numbers since the 1980s. The scarcity of flying insects then impacts on birds and bats, and well, we're talking about the whole ecosystem really, where wildflower meadows and the habitat that they provide are the basic building blocks of our ecology. So, members, are we going to stand by and do nothing? No, we're going to be part of the solution and not be part of the problem. I feel sure you're going to support this motion and join local authorities up and down the land which have already started to redress the balance and stop the decline in wildflower meadows. Thank you very much, Councillor Taylor. Um, have we got a seconder? Please, your turn. Thank you, Lord Mayor, and I, as many of the other uh, new councillors tonight, am really proud to get this opportunity to second a motion. Um, so, and for everybody's benefit, I just want to quickly inform members about um, a few more 
points about how a pollinator action plan, which is what the motion calls for, would look in reality. Um, or how it could look. There's already been quite a lot of work done um, at the City of York Council to this end and I would like to again draw your attention to the City of York Council's Biodiversity Action Plan of 2017, a very comprehensive document um, which we can look to. And also I'd like to commend the work that was done over a two-year period by Urban Buzz. Um, which had all of its targets met for increasing the buzzing habitats that are available to our pollinators in York. So we must do more and continue that work. Um, and to remind people, well, inform people as well, that the duty, not only of the National Pollinator Strategy that one of the members of the public talked about, but of a Natural Environment Act is that biodiversity is, must be made an integral part of our policy and decision making, which includes the restoration and enhancement of pollinator populations and their habitats. So there was a bit of work done last year by um, the former Green Councillor Lars Cram, and he has already set out some of the points that a pollinator action plan would include, and they are helping pollinators through regulatory functions, so local planning and development control, ensuring the conservation of pollinators is at the heart of how we manage land, so land management and verge management needs to be thought of with pollinators at the heart, and um, providing wider opportunities on the local authority estate for increasing pollinator protection, and monitoring actions and publicizing success. So finally, uh, another point is that we should raise awareness of this in our wider communities. And a small anecdote from my own ward um, of good practice in this area is that at Millthorpe School they have a wonderful unintended wildflower pop-up wild garden in the middle of the atrium of their school. And on a recent visit I said, wow, that is amazing, beautiful environment for the pollinators, great, thank you for doing that. And they said, uh, it's not supposed to look like that. Um, so I was able to say, well, you know, here are some reasons why actually this kind of garden, this kind of land management is better for pollinators and respects the natural order of the insects and the animals that are helping us in turn. So please vote for this motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I know I'll throw it open for debate. Can I see Councillor Waters? Councillor Pavlovich? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I'd certainly like to second um, this motion. Well, support this motion. I would have liked to have seconded it, but I was beaten to it. In fact, it's probably one of the most important and sensible motions I've seen presented at Council over quite a few years. Um, it might seem obscure to some, but without pollinating insects, the world's food sources would be very quickly compromised, and the consequences for the human race shouldn't need spelling out to everybody. But there's no need to read um, scientific studies on the decline of pollinating insects though. It's simple enough, just think about what your car windscreen was like 20 years ago to what it is now when you're driving along. There's very little to wipe off at the end of a, a summer's drive. Yes, there's concerns of a monoculture agriculture and certain agrochemicals, but one of the biggest causes is simply in habitat loss. Be that through agricultural methods, destruction of habitat for development, are methods of urban green infrastructure management. And it's the urban green infrastructure management of this council that this motion seeks to influence and not only deserves support now, but deserves a commitment and financial support by executive to enable real practical change in working practices at this council. Some of us have been banging on for over a decade about the simple expedient of wildflowering suitable verges in York. There's miles of rural and semi-rural verges in York, roundabouts and suitable parkland areas that could all have been wildflowered. And the only block on this has been the lack of skill set and lack of will at the council. Make no mistake, this will initially cost money to set up in terms of appropriate cutting and collection machinery and in respect of public engagement and education. And results will not, I make that clear, will not happen overnight. But with a once or twice a year cutting regime, coupled with the Horizons going to the anaerobic digester at Allerton Park, which facility we've now got to use, this council might 
eventually achieve annual savings comparable to those of Dorset Council, as mentioned in the motion. Savings that could then be spent on additional cuts to the suburban verges in residential areas that don't get cut often enough. That's a win-win situation. I'm all-heartedly supporting this, not because of what I consider to be hysterical climate extinction concerns, but because it's the right thing to do from an environmental perspective at local level to an eventual aesthetic one to an eventual cost savings one. So let York Council finally join other, more enlightened local authorities in green infrastructure management. And it's taken a hell of a long time to even get this far with the people that work here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Pavlovich. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm going to keep it very brief because I know we need to move on. Um, we support this motion, we support it fully. Um, the zeitgeist that um, uh, Councillor Taylor mentions is actually something that's been discussed in this city for a number of years without much support. Um, and you've heard from the public speaker and, and also from Councillor Waters, who um, I may disagree with on a number of factors, but he does know his plans. Um, I'm not an expert. But I do know that this city has an opportunity to both follow the lead of, of, of other local authorities and, and also move even further forward and be an exemplar of an environmentally friendly city. There are other things that we can do in addition to wildflowers. Um, we need to explore those as part, of, um, as part of our policy. So we will be supporting this motion. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Bassey. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'd like to start by declaring an interest. I'm passionate about leaving my daughters and all the children across York a natural heritage that they can cherish and enjoy, and this is part of that. I want to just talk briefly about money and I give you a, a seed of an idea, if I may. Um, one of the objections that is raised when we talk about trying to protect the natural world in this way, trying to look after pollinators, is we don't have the money, we don't have the resources, we have so many other priorities. So the first thing I want to say is, I don't think this is going to cost us a lot of money, and this is why. Two of us councillors went and met with a senior researcher at York University on Monday, and she was at pains to point out to us that almost all businesses in the city want to have a slice of green. They want to show that they're socially responsible when they get this agenda. So I think if we come up with plans that are reasonably priced, we will get support from the business community and we should seek it because we're all in this together. And then the seed of an idea I'd like to point to you again is inspired by the moon landings. I was just old enough to kind of be overwhelmed by it when I was a child. So my idea is I think we need to have an orbit of wild flowers around our city. And I know just where to put it, because every March we have a sea of daffodils around our city walls, and then they die down, and they're left slowly to die back. Why can we not have an orbiting sea of wild flowers every summer rising up in the same place. And before you tell me it's going to be very expensive, I did the maths. I failed my maths A level, but it's not too complicated. It costs about £7,000 to put one and a half grams of wild flower seeds on every square metre, three and a half kilometres, ten metres of wall, so seven and a half thousand, seven thousand pounds. I'm sure that we could find sponsorship for that. I'm sure we could find big business actually to say, we'll get volunteers to come and do the work. One person said to me, ah, there is a problem. You're going to have to dig holes to plant the wildflowers, and that's going to disturb the daffodil bulbs. It's not as easy as you think. Which then left me thinking, who's been digging all the holes for all the wildflowers for the past 20,000 years? I suspect there's a solution to that. I'm happy to support the motion, and I think it's vital that we start protecting the natural world. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, finally, I'm saying finally very loudly, Councillor Carr. Uh, 
Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, there's a tendency to treat this uh, sort of area of debate as whimsy uh, and the slight laughs and the smiles that it's attracted tonight uh, underpin that. But I agree with Councillor Waters. This is by far the most important motion tonight. The decline of pollinators and other insect species which are at the bottom of the food chain and perform other functions uh, underpin the whole ecostructure of this planet and it's declining rapidly. The decline in, in, in vertebrates is absolutely precipitous. At the side of this decline, the climate emergency will pale into insignificance. In fact, there won't be any species left on the planet, including our own, to benefit from any carbon reduction unless we take action in this area. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't think there's any more speakers. Can I take a vote on this? No, sorry. Do you want to have a right of reply? Just very briefly, Lord Mayor. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Fithian for coming to speak tonight. I was unaware that he was going to do so, uh, but he's certainly been banging on about this for 20 years or more, um, and probably has uh, John Cosson for that matter as well, who spoke. Uh, thank you to all the councillors who contributed. Uh, I think you all made very good points. Um, and um, as Rosie said, there is a great deal of uh, work that's already been done um, within the City of York Council and nationally. For some reason, that work has not taken place, taken root <laughs> in, uh, in the City of York. And we really need our officers to get a grip of it now. So hopefully, if you're all supporting this motion, uh, we will be able to do that. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Um, I will now take a vote on this motion. Um, can I see all those in favour of the motion, please show? I think once again we have reached unanimity. Thank you all. I do agree this is hugely important um, and we have got it to get it right and there are some wonderful opportunities to do so. As I indicated at the beginning, I am now going to vary the order of uh, business on the agenda and we will move to item number 13, the supplementary budget proposals um, for 2019-2020 and I will invite the leader, Councillor Aston, to move the recommendations in that report. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm very pleased to put forward uh, the budget amendments to Council tonight and, if agreed, kickstart new initiatives to improve the Council's frontline services, enhance our work with local communities and support our ambition to become carbon neutral by 2030. The budget amendments will act as a mid-year budget and utilise contingency funding and an underspend from the current financial year as outlined previously in the Council's most recent finance and performance report. The, pro the proposals seek to increase investment in the Council's frontline services in order to tackle issues such as graffiti on private premises, improve our work with communities to make them feel safer and more inclusive, and enhance our environment and highways network. Importantly, given the national funding crisis in social care, a significant amount of funding will also be used to support crucial services in children's and adult social care so that the Council can continue to protect some of the most vulnerable people in our city. Our new budget proposals have been designed to reflect this administration's priorities, but importantly, residents. We recognise that communities want to see frontline services improved. They want to see more initiatives to help to address climate change and also ensure those services which provide crucial care to others remain supported. Just to brief, briefly highlight some key initiatives in this amendment, it proposes 47,000 is spent to help tackle graffiti, that 2 million is invested to improve roads, footways and pedestrian and cycling infrastructure, that 66,000 is spent to create a new carbon reduction and sustainability post with a suitable project fund, that a 250,000 Safer and Inclusive Communities Fund is made available for local areas in order to improve our neighbourhoods, and that over 700,000 is used to support those services mentioned in children's and adult social care, including substance misuse and financial inclusion. Of course, 
there is much more included in our budget proposals, but members will be pleased to know that I, I will not go into further detail. I'll leave that to Councillor de Gaulle in, in a second. Over the coming months, further work will be carried out on the next full budget process, including consultation with residents later in the year. I hope that members are able to support the budget proposals this evening and in doing so, support the prioritisation of investment in frontline services, communities and in the ambitious to make York a truly sustainable city. Thank you, Lord Mayor. And may I have a seconder? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, this budget package is very much the first step for delivering our joint commitment to tackling the climate emergency installing capacity for us to take a lead and work together work towards the challenging 2030 target that all councillors and parties voted for in March this year. I feel I should pay tribute to the hard work of Councillor Craggill in drawing up our proposals um, which have formed a part of this joint programme. Um, there are some excellent ideas in the Labour amendment that could have been included in a cross-party a coalition which was rejected by Labour after the May elections. Nevertheless, we will still consider these carefully when preparing the main budget next year. Uh, just as previous administrations have drawn from Green opposition proposals in the past. With these plans coming forward in July, there is a challenge to deliver them within the current financial year. The Green Group has been keen to include staff and resources to support a hard-hitting carbon reduction programme, as well as to deliver the measures that make a, a difference in communities, as referred to by Councillor Aston. With my transport portfolio area, we will take forward the Res Park review, and I hope to be able to demonstrate that a relatively small investment in walking and cycling can make a big difference. Consulting with residents and local campaign groups to make it safer and easier to choose a healthy travel option. This budget also includes a commitment to work on public transport strategy to enable low carbon mobility to become much more of a norm for residents setting up home in the new developments proposed in the local plan and also help inform our new local transport plan. At the same time, I'm pleased that the budget demonstrates that environmental sustainability and support for our more vulnerable residents can and must go hand in hand with additional investment in play facilities, adult and children's social care, substance misuse services, inclusive growth and community engagement, which includes continued support for community hubs uh, and food poverty initiatives. I'm particularly pleased we were able to invest an additional £2 million to speed up improvements to standards in our council homes, including energy efficiency work to reduce climate emissions and energy bills. Through the Venture Fund, we are investing in an extension of a Housing First model for people with mental ill health and complex needs, increasing our mental health housing places from 48 to 90. Thank you very much. Um, we now have an amendment from the Labour Group. Councillor Myers, are you going to propose this? Thank you, Lord Mayor. I welcome the opportunity to move Labour's amendment to your supplementary budget. We've included items that we feel deserve urgent attention for urgent action to address what we feel are real emergencies facing the city at present. To put the current situation the city's facing in context, it is extremely distressing to Labour that the previous administration oversaw an increase of 4,000 of York's children living in poverty, a rise from 6,000 children to 10,000 children, 66% increase in just four years, and that is an absolute scandal. You do not have the right to call yourselves part of a progressive alliance on this measure alone, not to mention the other factors I've previously spoken about, such as rising inequality, falling wages, and the housing affordability crisis. For us, having 10,000 children living in poverty means more than just an uptick on a council monitoring report. It means more children going to school hungry, in ill-fitting uniforms, and going through the summer at risk of not eating one hot meal each day. It means drastically reduced life chances compared to friends and peers, and it means living in a cold home through the winter. We demand that you get a grip of this. 
for the people, families and children behind the statistics. Alongside a renewal of the failed child poverty strategy, we want annual appraisals of the actions and outcomes that the Council takes. We want emergency investment in food justice for this summer, which can be done immediately by implementing the recommendations of the York Food Justice Alliance. We urge you to make this change now. We want to see a pension credit campaign launched so that those who are in isolation, older people after going days on end without speaking or seeing anyone, can not just get their free TV licence, but also the additional help that the social security they are entitled to can give them, uh, they are entitled to can give them the confidence and means to go out and meet other people. We agree with additional investment in the basic essential services that York people expect. We say that it's about time. Under Labour, the time taken to remove both offensive and non-offensive graffiti was just one day. Under the Lib Dems, it's ballooned to five days and six days respectively. Fly-tipping cases have risen by more than 27% in the last four years, so we ask you to go one further and reduce the six-day fly-tipping response time to a next-day response. We would also bring forward today a buy local, promote local, grow local strategy for your businesses to retain more wealth within the city. You agreed to do this at full council over 15 months ago and yet I stand here again asking for the work to be done. It is a priority that will lead to increased wages in this city. Why the delay? Underpinning much of our values and beliefs is the idea that the most vulnerable in society are properly cared for with access to the same opportunities. The human rights status of this city that we've declared needs to be something that the whole city feels works in their favour and delivers improvements to their everyday life. I'll cut this then, Lord Mayor, on your advice got so much to say about this. It's not printed either, so members can't see what we're actually proposing in full. But I urge you all to genuinely consider supporting this amendment. It addresses a use of contingency budgets for crucial policies that are intrinsic to ensuring improved health, well-being and opportunity for everyone living in our city. Thank you. <laughs> Have I got a seconder? Have I got a seconder for the amendment? Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'd like to reserve the right to speak on this. That's fine. Um, the amendment is now open for debate. Can I see those wishing to speak? Uh, Councillor Eyre, did you put your hand up? Thank you, Lord Mayor. The, uh, the advantage of not writing a speech is that you don't have to rewrite it when somebody stands up to speak. So I think I was going to start by saying very positive things about the amendment and about working in collegiate fashion, but it's frustrating that the attitude from the, from the other side of the benches has not been quite the same. Uh, I think it's interesting. We've actually had four, by my recollection, former councillors from the City of York have attended the meeting today. Ironically, more than the Barnum Conservative group. Uh, one of those... No, five, actually, five members... One of those was Councillor Williams, who uh, stood in front of this, this particular council in December 2018 and lectured us at length about the problems of antisocial behaviour and crime. And I think one of the things he was saying was that the council recognises that in communities across the city, your residents feel that antisocial behaviour is on the rise. It's surprising, therefore, that this amendment put forward by the Labour group takes out the £250,000 that's been added for the Safer Communities Fund. Again, in terms of conversations we've had with the, with the Labour group going back a long time ago, they said at length they were interested in, in looking again at how we operate as a council. I think one of the first things that the council Myers asked us following the election was whether we would look into introducing some sort of committee system and change the way the decision-making was done. He said that was a key commitment for that administration. Through this budget amendment, he takes out, the Labour group take out all of the funding that would see that work done and look to see how the council can operate in a more transparent and collegiate fashion. There is also the issue that there are significant increases in terms of the capital budget. We're talking into millions and millions of pounds. For some reason, however, none of the costs borne by that capital investment are included anywhere in the revenue implications. 
Therefore, as I can see it, the budget itself isn't actually fiscally sound. Without actually outlining how you will pay for the revenue, pay for the capital funding through revenue, we're left with an intimation that there will be severe cuts to frontline services to pay for that capital investment, and you've failed to outline precisely how that will happen. I appreciate the difficulties of the Labour Group. There isn't a particularly long time in terms of dealing with this. It is what is by nature known as an emergency budget. It doesn't give you the time, so I don't lay the blame of that at your door. But on the basis of that and some of the other issues that I've raised in terms of the issues with the things you're taking out of the, the current emergency budget, it's not something that I or I think the particular Lib Dem Group could support as it is. But as I started by saying this, we want to work in a collegiate fashion. We want to draw the best from all members around this particular table. And I think, as Councillor de Gorn said, these are issues that we can look to you going forward in terms of the budget-making process for the next four years and see how some of these really commendable options that you put forward can be properly costed and looked at being implemented in the future budgets going forward. Just a very brief uh, couple of points I want to make. Um, it's been a very collegiate uh, evening thus far, um, but just in the last five minutes, we've had some real factual inaccuracies being put out here. And if you want us to work together, and I am very much in favour of working together for the best of the city, then that has to be about building trust, doesn't it? And if we are repeating information which is not correct, and I'm looking at you, Councillor de Gorn, at the moment, because it is not the case that there was ever an offer put on the table for the Labour group to join into a three-way administration. The Liberal Democrats never once approached us, and the smirk on Councillor Aston's face when you said that and fell into his trap and played his game tells us everything that we need to know in terms of the scapegoats that you are going to be made if you are not very, very careful. Now, we would like to see a progressive approach to the city, but if we are going to keep getting information and uh, misinformation about where we're coming from put out in this sort of an environment, all it does is destroys trust between members and in the wider situation, in the wider city, they look at us and they think it's pathetic. So let's pretend that that bit didn't happen. Let's try to go back to the thoughtful and progressive way that we were conducting this meeting so far and please let us stop with this putting out of misinformation about what does and doesn't happen in the council chamber and in meetings elsewhere. Thank you very much. Councillor Craghill. I thought there was someone else first. Um, yes, I was just going to um, comment um, from my portfolio area really on the capital um, proposal in, in your amendment um, on, on the housing um, aspects, the investment in um, decent homes um, standard. Um, basically, I think, um, probably like quite a few of the other things in your budget amendment, what you're proposing, as far as I can see, is really quite similar to what we are actually planning or hoping to do through our amendment. Um, you're proposing to invest a bit more in this budget um, than, than we've put in, a bit more. Um, but basically, from my point of view, my approach is that um, this is a first step, and I'm certainly open to reviewing if we need to put more in in future. So, so I don't think there's a great difference between us there. Um, in terms of the decent home standard itself, I'm not quite sure what you mean in, in the budget line by um, a basic standard and then a decent standard. The decent home standard is a national statu statutory measure we have to report on. I'm told in statutory terms there's no such thing as a basic standard. Um, the decent home standard is the minimum. Um, the reason why um, quite a number of properties on our list um, are classified in this way is because we don't have up-to-date electrical certificates for them. And it's not actually based on visiting properties. Uh, but what we are doing um, is, is a new stock condition survey uh, that's underway. So this will give us an accurate overview of properties based on actual conditions. Um, it may also highlight other issues that we'd wish to address. Um, 
as we don't just want to meet statutory minimums, we want, we want to ensure that all our homes are of a very high standard um, across the board. So that's why we're investing two million in our budget, um, in speeding up work through major repairs and modernisation programmes, and also in energy efficiency. Um, you make a reference in your budget line to stamping out the damp. And I entirely agree with you um, from the World Council's perspective. A lot of residents are concerned about damping properties, and this is certainly something that we should be working on. I think it's important to recognise that we do have a number of areas in the city where standing water underneath properties is an issue. And we currently are investing um, 700,000 this year in, in addressing that, and also in future years that's in the programme. Um, I can. I suppose what I'm saying is that um, I think we agree about a lot of what needs to be done. Um, there are still many improvements that can be made, but I'm certainly very happy to engage uh, with anyone to talk about positive suggestions. And indeed, I am meeting you as councillors next week to talk about this, this area. So I do think, you know, we agree on a lot in this, really. I think you've finished. Thank you. Councillor Perrett. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I've got to say it's my first time speaking in this council and I am a little bit disappointed that, you know, there are these allegations being thrown around about not working together collegiately and it's, it is, if, as Councillor Crawshaw said, the members of the public are going to see this and they're going to be really shocked at the conduct, I think, of some members in here. Basically, some of the amendments we were making are focused on how we help people who are most vulnerable and most in need. So for the Safer Communities Fund, we did want to remove some of that because we felt that it should have been more strategic and citywide rather than funding being allocated in the same way that ward funding is. We would prefer to see it go to places with greater need and I'm frankly yet yeah, a little bit disappointed about the governance issue as well that we wanted to remove some of the funding for looking at getting a citizens assembly on governance and um, moving it in our amendment because we, well, we, uh, excuse me, sorry, I think I'm going to sneeze, really bad hair fever, the pollinator uh, thing was very good, uh, yeah, personally, <laughs> didn't want to have to vote for it, um, so, excuse me, in the amendment that we put forward about removing the money for governance, part of the issue for that is that we feel that there are better things that citizens' assemblies could be used for. We didn't feel that it was the right thing. You know, I just think it's, it's a bit shocking that it's been misrepresented in this way that we were not willing to work with you. As was mentioned, there was not a lot of time for us to pull this together, sure, but there was also not a lot of approaches made from the other side to give us any kind of heads up so we could have these conversations. So, yeah, thank you, Rob Mayor. If there are no more speakers, I will ask Councillor Aspen to... You don't get a right of reply, I'm sorry. It's an iniquity that has been going down the ages forever and we've all suffered. Councillor Aspen, your right of reply. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Lord Mayor. And, and yes, it's always been something that niggles that the council leader gets far more rights of, of right to reply when Councillor Carr and others had it. But none, you know, I'll enjoy it now that I've got it for a limited period of, of time. Um, following Councillor Craghills and, and, and Councillor Ayres, Comments. Obviously, I would hope that, that, that members would not um, vote for the amendment in, in front of us. Uh, there are an awful lot of schemes within that amendment that I'm sure respective executive members would be more than happy to work with Labour spokespeople as we get towards the budget and into the future uh, to see how we can implement and, and deliver uh, those. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm slightly bemused by the conversations when we're all actually working across parties, to be, each of us is suggesting that the other is not working as much a cross-party fashion as, as the other is, so I will, resist, I will resist the temptation to go there, only to say the only reason I smirked was not as characterised, but was simply because Councillor de Gorn's comment caused so much commotion amongst the, the, the Labour uh, spokespeople. Uh, but I, I have been passed a note to say that Labour did make it clear that they would not join a Lib Dem-led uh, administration fact. Um, so that's just the point on, on that. But going back to the substantive issues, 
Um, just as, as privately a lot of Labour members and councillors have said that there is an awful lot in the uh, supplementary and new budget proposals that are to be welcomed and that they would be really keen to work with us equally in response. Let's discuss some of those other areas because, as Councillor Crackhill said, there really, really isn't an awful lot uh, of difference and actually we should be talking about some of those areas that we can agree on and deliver for the city. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will now call upon a vote on the amendment. Can I see those in favour of the amendment, please show. Are those against the amendment? Uh, it does seem in some way that the amendment has been lost. Um, any abstentions? Oh, we have one abstention. Thank you very much. Um, I now come to take a vote on the motion itself, as originally presented, the motion for a supplementary budget. Can I see those in favour of the supplementary budget unamended? Want to debate on the... <laughs> I'm sorry, we should have the opportunity, Councillor Aspen, I do apologise. Do, does any member wish to speak on the actual amendment? Not the motion. Not the motion. <laughs> unamended. <coughs> Councillor Douglas. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I am disappointed to hear the response of the administration around uh, making accusations that I don't think actually hold up. But um, we'll forget that and say that we are happy to support the motion and the budget and we'd like to move it to a vote please proposal that it is moved to the vote does it need it needs a seconder can we see it somebody who hasn't spoken michael councillor pavlovich seconding the motion that it goes to the vote uh, all those in favour of it going to the vote, please show. It seems to have been carried unanimously. We will take no further debate on the matter. All those in favour of the supplementary budget proposal, please show. And abstention? One abstention. Thank you very much. That has been carried. We now revert to the agenda as it was. Oh, if I can find my way back to where we were. Questions. Questions to the leader or executive members. At what point do we... Oh, right, come on, let's do quick. One, two, three, four, four. Kept going. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I would just like to ask um, the Executive Member of Finance and Performance to provide members with an update of Booth and Park Hospital, please. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I think it's important to say that we're now ready to publish the proposed master plan for the site following extensive consultation last year. I think it's fair to say Bootham Park is an iconic site with a long heritage and is a key asset for the city. Securing a positive future for this site, one that retains benefit for York residents, has always been of utmost importance to us. We have worked tirelessly to develop a master plan that is both a viable option and will invite residents to give us their views coming in September. In the meantime, NHS property services have failed to secure a preferred bidder for the site and they continue to market the site for private sale. We are disappointed they have failed to engage us or discuss options. We believe there are several levers that we can use to influence a positive feature for the site and will bring options to the executive in the autumn. Who's next? Councillor Waters, I think. 
Thank you, Lord Mayor. <clears throat> I was going to ask this in uh, section 10, but just edging my bets, I'll ask this of the executive member for um, finance, the council leader, or the executive member for leisure, whoever wishes to answer. Would those executive members care to confirm, and a simple yes or no will suffice, if in regard to the community stadium, the NHS is a large financially strategic partner, has signed its lease for occupancy of its huge part of the project, and similarly, can the executive members confirm the changing of specifications for the NHS for their occupancy has led to the current, well, long-running delays to the project, and can those members confirm who is paying for these changes and who will pick up the tab if the NHS don't sign up to a lease? After all, the NHS are exactly flush with funds. Thank you, Lord Mayor. As tempted as I was to pass that on to Councillor Smalley and <laughs> see him answer that question in complete depth, it is technically my portfolio area. Technically, two questions. Uh, in terms of site delay, as Councillor Waters knows quite clearly, there are multitudes of reasons in terms of impacting upon the timescale of that project. Yes, as was published on the Council's Open Data website, changes introduced by the NHS have led to a certain aspect of delay in terms of the project. How you assign that to the quantum of the delay, how you assign that to the entire build programme is not entirely clear, and that is a process that is worked through with Council officers, with GLL, with the contractor. It's commercially confidential, as you well know, and it's not something that we can begin to discuss. I think uh, the Honourable the Alderman mentioned earlier that we should probably publish all of the information we have in terms of the, the stadium and what's happening in the stadium. We do receive monthly updates from the contractor. There are a lot of conversations that are had behind do closed doors. They are confidential. As one of the other public speakers mentioned earlier, I don't have a record of releasing confidential information into the public domain, and I'm not about to start doing that now. That's a matter of a breach of the Member's Code of Conduct and not something I will do. And that suggestion that we should start publishing all our commercially confidential information to the public, thus weakening our position with the contractor and possibly, well, ultimately, definitely increasing the cost to us as a council and to the taxpayer by weakening what we can have with that contractor is a frankly ridiculous idea and I don't think that's something that you in particular would support. Is that a supplementary, Councillor Waters? I'd love to ask that because I, I did ask for a simple yes or no. Have the NHS signed the lease? That's not commercially confidential. I'm not asking for the terms of the lease. Yes or no, have they signed the lease? The NHS have signed their commitments, yes. Councillor Douglas. Thank you, Lord Mayor. This is a question for the Executive Member for Economy and Strategy and Strategic Planner, Councillor Waller, um, Planning rather, Councillor Waller. Can the Executive Member confirm whether or not he sees the Council playing any role in supporting the local economy and increasing the number of better paid jobs in the city? I certainly do. And I, when I was last in the economic portfolio holding position, uh, worked diligently on this respect. Supplementary. That sounds uh, very positive to me. Thank you for that. But um, unfortunately, I have to say it hasn't been that clear um, for some time and the absence of a written report or any priorities at the scrutiny meeting last week was a cause for concern. Can he explain what he will do to convince us the next four years won't simply be a con continuation of the last four with similarly poor outcomes for the city? As I said at the um, scrutiny meeting, I'm coming on the 11th of September and I hope that there may be some positive work between the two of us. Councillor Pavlovich? Or is this a, this is, is this no, a it's supplementary? No, no, no. It's all right. You can go. No, thank you. This is, um, this is a question for um, the Executive Member for Housing. You won't be surprised. Um, the sites included in the housing delivery programme propose selling off 60% of new homes at market rate. When the city has over a thousand people awaiting housing in gold and silver bands, 
um, in priority need on the waiting list. Um, is this a policy the executive member is comfortable with uh, or is it one that she'll seek to alter to increase the amount of social housing and reduce the net amount of market rate sale? Um, my objective as executive member in this portfolio is in the longer term to explore every way that we can deliver more affordable housing that, that, that we possibly can. Mm. Um, and that's reflected in a longer report that I've provided to scrutiny next week. Um, in terms of the current housing delivery programme and the 60-40 split, obviously the funding to deliver affordable housing has to come from somewhere. So in the current programme, it comes from the 60% market housing. I have asked officers if we can, as we go forward, explore the potential to increase that amount. Um, but obviously we still have to fund, we still have to fund it somehow without undermining the financial stability of the housing revenue account. Um, the current housing delivery programme does also already commit us to delivering more than 40% affordable on some of the sites the smaller sites, but has that 60-40 split on the larger sites, as I said, so to provide a, a reasonable funding uh, model. So I have asked, if can we increase the percentage a bit within this current model? I will also be asking, what other models can we look at? What are the ways of delivering affordable housing can we consider? Whether that's working in partnership with other social landlords, whether it's looking at community-led delivery, whether it's looking at different sorts of models, which are already, there are some discussions about what we can do on York Central in terms of community-led delivery models, housing trusts, housing development trusts, all those sort of things I do want to explore. And as you know, I'm very happy to work with you, Councillor Pavlovic, uh, on any ideas that you have in that respect. Supplementary? No. 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 Any more questions? Fiona. Thank you, Lord Mayor. This is directed at the Executive Member for Children, Young People and Education. In 2016, <coughs> York Liberal Democrats approved cuts of around £1.5 million to services supporting children and young people, spawning the local area team model but with a fraction of the money and staff previously available. The bold statement was even made that more would actually be done for York children and their families. Since that time, the most serious Section 47 social work cases have risen by around 260%. In light of those figures, would Councillor Cuthbertson explain how well he feels the local area team model as resourced has performed in both early intervention and preventing more serious cases of potential or actual significant harm to children. Councillor Cuthbertson. Yep. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, as Councillor Fitzpatrick will know, this is quite a wide and quite a deep portfolio, and I celebrate eight weeks in this portfolio today. So I haven't quite got round to examining the efficiency and effectiveness of local area teams that will be on my list for about a fortnight's time. I've had other concerns in the meantime, but I will pick up the point and I will respond to you in writing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Supplementary? No. Any further questions? Yes, Councillor Oral. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Can the uh, Executive Member for Finance confirm whether he intends to implement the £10 parking charge for the community stadium uh, car park. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, I can confirm I've asked that it's not implemented at this moment in time, and the particular issue will come to a joint decision session with myself and Councillor de Gorn to consider the matter further. But it will not be implemented at the moment. A supplementary? No. I can't see anybody else raising their hand. I am conscious we are now at 5 to 10, um, and I think probably I'm getting 
Custom and practice. I always thought custom and practice, we finished at 10 o'clock. I am advised that we could go on till 10 past 10 if we wanted to. What? I'm getting... Personally, I suspect we all quite fancy finishing around 10 o'clock. So unless there is any... I think we will pull down the guillotine and move through the final items on this agenda fairly briefly. So that brings us, and Councillor Eyre has actually picked up quite a few questions as an executive member. Councillor Eyre, do you want to move your report? Formally, Formally. moved, Lord Mayor. And have you got a seconder? Formally seconded, Lord Mayor. Thank you very much. Ah. Uh, I would say that we would now agree that the... Uh, that you want some questions, Dawn? Hmm? <laughs> well, I am looking at the clock, and it is coming up to 10 o'clock. All right, I'll take three questions to Councillor Eyre, quick. Three questions on... If anybody's got three questions they want to put no. to no. Councillor Eyre, no. you're getting off lightly. No. No. Nobody wishes to, um, to ask a question. So we now come to the Chair of the Customer and Corporate Services Scrutiny Management Committee. Um, and it's the report from the new Chair, Councillor Crawshaw. I will just very quickly formally move the um, report um, for Council to endorse and I would just like to bring members' attention to the meeting of the Vice Chairs and Chairs of Scrutiny that took place at the beginning of July. Um, we're looking at ways that we can make scrutiny function in a uh, more um, collegiate and uh, certainly uh, a way that uh, gives it a bit more teeth. Um, so we hope that we'll have the support of the Executive and of Senior Council Officers in that. And I would like to put out to all members um, that we would be welcoming um, suggestions for scrutiny topics. That also goes to officers and, of course, residents as well. Thank you. Have I got a seconder for that report? Councillor? Formally seconded, Lord Mayor. Is there any debate people wish to have on that report? No. Nope. <coughs> We then, then move on to the annual report of the Audit and Governance Committee. Um, Chair, I think you've got, 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 got to have a vote, I'm afraid, on the recommendation. Was there a recommendation? Off, Chair, so there needs to be a, re a vote on the recommendation. Did you move that recommendation, yes. Councillor Crawshaw? I thought I did right yes. at the start. That's yes. fine, and you seconded it. Yes. Can we have a vote on the recommendation? I think we've all agreed to that one. Thank you very much indeed. Right, sorry, I'm rushing too fast. Audit and Governance. Michael pa Councillor Pavlovich. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I formally move um, that this annual report be uh, accepted. Does any... Is there a seconder for this? Thank you very much. Is there any debate on the annual report of the Audit and Governance Committee? I hope not, because I wasn't at any of the meetings. No. We can now move on. I think we've finished the business. Again, I think we have to accept it. I think... Will you agree the report of the Audit and Governance? Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right. You're finished. We are there. Thank you very much indeed. Well, you know, guys.